Section 59 of Tom Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Book 17. Containing Three Days. Chapter 1. Containing a Portion of Introductory Writing. When a comic writer hath made his principal characters as happy as he can, or when a tragic writer hath brought them to the highest pitch of human misery, they both conclude their business to be done, and that their work is come to a period. Had we been of the tragic complexion, the reader must now allow we were very nearly arrived at this period, since it would be difficult for the devil, or any of his representatives on earth, to have contrived much greater torments for poor Jones than those in which we left him in the last chapter, and as for Sophia, a good-natured woman would hardly wish more uneasiness to a rival than what she must at present be supposed to feel. What then remains to complete the tragedy but a murder or two, and a few moral sentences? but to bring our favourites out of their present anguish and distress, and to land them at last on the shore of happiness, seems a much harder task, a task indeed so hard that we do not undertake to execute it. In regard to Sophia, it is more than probable that we shall somewhere or other provide a good husband for her in the end, either Bliffel, or my lord, or somebody else. But as to poor Jones, such are the calamities in which he is at present involved, owing to his imprudence, by which if a man doth not become felon to the world, he is at least a fellow de se. So destitute is he now of friends, and so persecuted by enemies, that we almost despair of bringing him to any good. And if our reader delights in seeing executions, I think he ought not to lose any time in taking a first row at Tyburn. This I faithfully promise, that, notwithstanding any affection which we may be supposed to have for this rogue, whom we have unfortunately made our hero, we will lend him none of that supernatural assistance with which we are entrusted, upon condition that we use it only on very important occasions. If he doth not therefore find some natural means of fairly extricating himself from all his distresses, we will do no violence to the truth and dignity of history for his sake for we had rather relate that he was hanged at Tyburn, which may very probably be the case, than forfeit our integrity, or shock the faith of our reader. In this the ancients had a great advantage over the moderns. Their mythology, which was at that time more firmly believed by the vulgar than any religion is at present, gave them always an opportunity of delivering a favourite hero. Their deities were always ready at the writer's elbow to execute any of his purposes, and the more extraordinary the invention was, the greater was the surprise and delight of the credulous reader. Those writers could with greater ease have conveyed a hero from one country to another, nay, from one world to another, and have brought him back again, than a poor circumscribed modern can deliver him from a jail. The Arabians and Persians had an equal advantage in writing their tales from the genii and fairies, which they believe in as an article of their faith upon the authority of the Koran itself but we have none of these helps. To natural means alone we are confined. Let us try, therefore, what, by these means, may be done for poor Jones. Though, to confess the truth, something whispers me in the ear that he doth not yet know the worst of his fortune, and that a more shocking piece of news than any he hath yet heard remains for him in the unopened leaves of fate. CHAPTER Two, THE GENEROUS AND GRATEFUL BEHAVIOR OF MRS. MILLER Mr. Allworthy and Mrs. Miller were just sat down to breakfast when Bliffel, who had gone out very early that morning, returned to make one of the company. He had not been long seated before he began as follows. "'Good Lord! My dear uncle, what do you think hath happened? I vow I am afraid of telling it to you, for fear of shocking you with the remembrance of ever having shown any kindness to such a villain.' "'What is the matter, child?' said the uncle. "'I fear I have shown kindness in my life to the unworthy more than once.' but charity doth not adopt the vices of its objects. "'Oh, sir,' returned Bliffel, "'it is not without this secret direction of providence that you mention the word adoption. Your adopted son, sir, that Jones, that wretch whom you nourished in your bosom, hath proved one of the greatest villains upon earth.' "'By all that's sacred, it is false,' cries Mrs. Miller. "'Mr. Jones is no villain. He is one of the worthiest creatures breathing, and if any other person had called him a villain, I would have thrown all this boiling water in his face. Mr. Allworthy looked very much amazed at this behaviour, but she did not give him leave to speak before, turning to him, she cried, I hope you will not be angry with me. I would not offend you, sir, for the world, but indeed I could not bear to hear him called so. 
"'I must own, madam,' said Allworthy, very gravely, "'I am a little surprised to hear you so warmly defend a fellow you do not know.' "'Oh, I do know him, Mr. Allworthy,' said she. "'Indeed I do. I should be the most ungrateful of all wretches if I denied it. Oh, he hath preserved me and my little family. We have all reason to bless him while we live. And I pray heaven to bless him, and turn the hearts of his malicious enemies. I know, I find, I see he hath such.' "'You surprise me, madam, still more,' said Allworthy. "'Sure you must mean some other.' It is impossible you should have any such obligations to the man my nephew mentions. Too surely, answered she, I have obligations to him of the greatest and tenderest kind. He hath been the preserver of me and mine. Believe me, sir, he hath been abused, grossly abused to you. I know he hath, or you, whom I know to be all goodness and honour, would not, after the many kind and tender things I have heard you say of this poor, helpless child, have so disdainfully called him fellow. Indeed, my best of friends, he deserves a kinder appellation from you. Had you heard the good, the kind, the grateful things which I have heard him utter of you? He never mentions your name, but with a sort of adoration. In this very room I have seen him on his knees, imploring all the blessings of heaven upon your head. I do not love that child there better than he loves you. I see, sir, now said Bliffle, with one of those grinning sneers with which the devil marks his best beloved. "'Mrs. Miller really doth know him. I suppose you will find she is not the only one of your acquaintance to whom he hath exposed you. As for my character, I perceive, by some hints she hath thrown out, he hath been very free with it, but I forgive him.' "'And the Lord forgive you, sir,' said Mrs. Miller. "'We have all sins enough to stand in need of his forgiveness.' "'Upon my word, Mrs. Miller,' said Allworthy. I do not take this behaviour of yours to my nephew kindly, and I do assure you, as any reflections which you cast upon him must come only from that wickedest of men, they would only serve, if that were possible, to heighten my resentment against him. For I must tell you, Mrs. Miller, the young man who now stands before you hath ever been the warmest advocate for the ungrateful wretch whose cause you espouse. This, I think, when you hear it from my own mouth, will make you wonder at so much baseness and ingratitude." "'You are deceived, sir,' answered Mrs. Miller. "'If they were the last words which were to issue from my lips, I would say you were deceived, and I once more repeat it, the Lord forgive those who have deceived you. I do not pretend to say the young man is without faults, but they are all the faults of wildness and of youth, faults which he may, nay, which I am certain he will, relinquish, and, if he should not, they are vastly overbalanced by one of the most humane, tender, honest hearts that ever man was blessed with indeed mrs miller said allworthy had this been related of you i should not have believed it indeed sir answered she you will believe everything i have said i am sure you will and when you have heard the story which i shall tell you for i will tell you all you will be so far from being offended that you will own i know your justice so well that i must have been the most despicable and most ungrateful of wretches if i had acted any other part than i have "'Well, madam,' said Allworthy, "'I shall be very glad to hear any good excuse for a behaviour which, I must confess, I think wants an excuse. And now, madam, will you be pleased to let my nephew proceed in his story without interruption? He would not have introduced a matter of slight consequence with such a preface. Perhaps even this story will cure you of your mistake.' Mrs. Miller gave tokens of submission, and then Mr. Bliffle began thus. I am sure, sir, if you don't think proper to resent the ill usage of Mrs. Miller, I shall easily forgive what affects me only. I think your goodness hath not deserved this indignity at her hands. Well, child, said Allworthy, but what is this new instance? What hath he done of late? What, cries Bliffle, notwithstanding all Mrs. Miller hath said, I am very sorry to relate, and what you should never have heard from me, had it not been a matter impossible to conceal from the whole world. In short, he hath killed a man. I will not say murdered, for perhaps it may not be so construed in law, and I hope the best for his sake. Allworthy looked shocked and blessed himself, and then, turning to Mrs. Miller, he cried, Well, madam, what say you now? Why, I say, sir, answered she, that I never was more concerned at anything in my life. But, if the fact be true, I am convinced the man, whoever he is, was in fault. Heaven knows there are many villains in this town who make it their business to provoke young gentlemen, 
Nothing but the greatest provocation could have tempted him, for of all the gentlemen I ever had in my house I never saw one so gentle and so sweet-tempered. He was beloved by every one in the house, and every one who came near it. While she was thus running on, a violent knocking at the door interrupted their conversation, and prevented her from proceeding further, or from receiving any answer, for, as she concluded this was a visitor to Mr. Allworthy, she hastily retired, taking with her her little girl, whose eyes were all over blubbered at the melancholy news she heard of Jones, who used to call her his little wife, and not only gave her many playthings, but spent whole hours in playing with her himself. Some readers may perhaps be pleased with these minute circumstances, in relating of which we follow the example of Plutarch, one of the best of our brother historians, and others, to whom they may appear trivial, will, we hope, at least pardon them, as we are never prolix on such occasions. CHAPTER Three, THE ARRIVAL OF MR. WESTON, WITH SOME MATTERS CONCERNING THE PATERNAL AUTHORITY Mrs. Miller had not long left the room when Mr. Weston entered but not before a small wrangling bout had passed between him and his chairman, for the fellows, who had taken up their burden at the Hercules Pillars, had conceived no hopes of having any future good customer in the squire, and they were moreover farther encouraged by his generosity, for he had given them of his own accord sixpence more than their fare. They therefore very boldly demanded another shilling, which so provoked the squire that he not only bestowed many hearty curses on them at the door, but retained his temper after he came into the room, swearing that all the Londoners were like the court, and thought of nothing but plundering country gentlemen. "'Damn me,' says he, "'if I won't walk in the rain rather than get into one of their hand barrows again. They've jolted me more in a mile than Brown Bess would in a long fox-chase.' When his wrath on this occasion was a little appeased, he resumed the same passionate tone on another. "'There,' says he, "'There's fine business forwards now. The hounds have changed at last, and when we imagined we had a fox to deal with, odd rat it, it turns out to be a badger at last.' "'Pray, my good neighbour, said Allworthy, "'drop your metaphors and speak a little plainer.' "'Why, then,' says the squire, "'to tell you plainly, we've been all this time afraid of a son of a whore of a bastard of somebody's. I don't know whose, not I, and now here's a confounded son of a whore of a lord, who may be a bastard too for what I know or care, for he shall never have a daughter of mine by my consent. They have beggared the nation, but they shall never beggar me. My land shall never be sent over to Hanover. "'You surprise me much, my good friend,' said Allworthy. "'Why, Zoons, I am surprised myself,' answered the squire. "'I went to see Sister Weston last night, according to her own appointment, and there I was head into a whole room full of women.' There was my lady cousin Bellaston, and my lady Betty, and my lady Catherine, and my lady I don't know who. Damn me, if ever you catch me among such a kennel of hoop petticoat bitches. Damn me, I'd rather be run by my own dogs, as one Acton was, that the story-book says was turned into a hare, and his own dogs killed him and ate him. Odd rabbit it, no mortal was ever run in such a manner. If I dodged one way, one at me. If I offered to clap back, another snapped me. Oh, certainly one of the greatest matches in England, says one cousin. Here he attempted to mimic them. "'A very advantageous offer, indeed,' cries another cousin. "'For you must know they be all my cousins, though I never seed half of them before.' "'Truly,' says that fat-ass bitch, my lady Bellison, "'cousin, you must be out of your wits to think of refusing such an offer.' "'Now I begin to understand,' says Allworthy. "'Some person hath made proposals to Miss Weston, which the ladies of the family approve, but is not to your liking.' "'My liking?' said Weston. "'How the devil should it?' I tell you it is a lord, and those are always folks whom you know I always resolve to have nothing to do with. Did and I refuse a matter of forty years' purchase now for a bit of land, which one of em had a mind to put into a park, only because I would have no dealings with lords, and thus think I would marry my daughter, Sue? Besides, bent I engaged to you, and did I ever go off any bargain when I had promised? As to that point, neighbour, said Allworthy, I entirely release you from any engagement. No contract can be binding between parties who have not a full power to make it at the time, nor ever afterwards acquire the power of fulfilling it. "'Slut, then,' answered Weston. "'I tell you, I have power, and I will fulfil it. Come along with me directly to Doctor's Commons. I will get a license, and I will go to Sister and take away the wrench by force, and she shall hang, or I will lock her up, and keep her upon bread and water as long as she lives.' "'Mr. Weston,' said Allworthy, "'shall I beg you will hear my full sentiments on this matter?' "'Hear thee? Ay, to be sure I will,' answered he. "'Why then, sir,' cries Allworthy, "'I can truly say, without a compliment either to you or the young lady, "'that when this match was proposed, I embraced it very readily and heartily, "'for my regard to you both. 
an alliance between two families so nearly neighbours, and between whom there had always existed so mutual an intercourse in good harmony, I thought a most desirable event, and with regard to the young lady, not only the concurrent opinion of all who knew her, but my own observation assured me that she would be an inestimable treasure to a good husband. I shall say nothing of her personal qualifications, which certainly are admirable. Her good nature, her charitable disposition, her modesty, are too well known to need any panegyric. But she hath one quality which existed in a high degree, in that best of women, who is now one of the first of angels, which, as it is not of a glaring kind, more commonly escapes observation. So little indeed is it remarked that I want a word to express it. I must use negatives on this occasion. I never heard anything of pertness, or what is called repartee, out of her mouth. No pretence to wit, much less to that kind of wisdom which is the result only of great learning and experience, the affectation of which, in a young woman, is as absurd as any of the affectations of an ape. No dictatorial sentiments, no judicial opinions, no profound criticisms. Whenever I have seen her in the company of men, she hath been all attention, with the modesty of a learner, not the forwardness of a teacher. You'll pardon me for it, but I once, to try her only, desired her opinion on a point which was controverted between Mr. Thwackham and Mrs. Square, to which she answered with much sweetness, You'll pardon me, good Mr. Allworthy, I am sure you cannot in earnest think me capable of deciding any point in which two such gentlemen disagree. Thwackham and Square, who both alike thought themselves sure of a favourable decision, seconded my request. She answered with the same good humour, I must absolutely be excused for I will front neither so much as to give my judgment on his side. Indeed, she always showed the highest deference to the understandings of men, a quality absolutely essential to the making a good wife. I shall only add that as she is most apparently void of all affectation, this deference must be certainly real. Here Blifil sighed bitterly, upon which Weston, whose eyes were full of tears at the praise of Sophia, blubbered out, "'Don't be chicken-hearted, for should her, damn me, should her, if she was twenty times as good. "'Remember your promise, sir,' cried Orthy. "'I was not to be interrupted.' "'Well, shut it, answered the squire. "'I won't speak another word.' "'Now, my good friend,' continued Orthy, "'I have dwelt so long on the merit of this young lady, partly as I really am in love with her character, partly that fortune, for the match in that light is really advantageous on my nephew's side, might not be imagined to be my principal view in having so eagerly embraced the proposal.' Indeed, I heartily wished to receive so great a jewel into my family, but, though I may wish for many good things, I would not therefore steal them, or be guilty of any violence or injustice to possess myself of them. Now, to force a woman into a marriage contrary to her consent or approbation is an act of such injustice and oppression that I wish the laws of our country could restrain it. But a good conscience is never lawless in the worst regulated state, and will provide those laws for itself which the neglect of legislators hath forgotten to supply. This is surely a case of that kind, for is it not cruel, nay, impious, to force a woman into that state against her will, for her behaviour, in which she is to be accountable to the highest and most dreadful court of judicature, and to answer at the peril of her soul? To discharge the matrimonial duties in an adequate manner is no easy task, and shall we lay this burden upon a woman, while we at the same time deprive her of all that assistance which may enable her to undergo it? Shall we tear her very heart from her, while we enjoin her duties, to which a whole heart is scarce equal? I must speak very plainly here. I think parents who act in this manner are accessories to all the guilt which their children afterwards incur, and of course must, before a just judge, expect to partake of their punishment. But if they could avoid this, Good heaven! Is there a soul who can bear the thought of having contributed to the damnation of his child? For these reasons, my best neighbour, as I see the inclinations of this young lady are most unhappily averse to my nephew, I must decline any further thoughts of the honour you intended him, though I assure you I shall always retain the most grateful sense of it. Well, sir, said Weston, the froth bursting forth from his lips the moment they were uncorked. You cannot say but I've heard you out, and now I expect you'll hear me. And if I don't answer every word on it, why then I'll consent to keep the manner up. First then, I desire you to answer me one question. Did not I beget her? Did not I beget her? Answer me that. They say, indeed, it is a wise father that knows his own child, but I'm sure I've the best title to her, for I bred her up. 
but I believe you will allow me to be your father, and if I be, am I not to govern my own child? I ask you that. Am I not to govern my own child? And if I am to govern her in other matters, surely I am to govern her in this, which concerns her most. And what am I desiring all this while? Am I desiring her to do anything for me? To give me anything? So much on the other side, that I am only desiring her to take away half my estate now, and the other half when I die. Well, what is it all for? Why, isn't it to make her happy? It's enough to make one mad to hear folks talk, and if I was going to marry myself, then she would have reason to cry and to blubber, but on the contrary, and I offered to bind down my land in such a manner that I could not marry if I would, seeing as ne'er a woman upon earth would have me. What the devil in hell can I do more? I contribute to her damnation? Zerns, I'd see all the world damned before a little finger should be heard. Indeed, Mr. Allworthy, you must excuse me, but I'm surprised to hear you talk in such a manner, and I must say, take it how you will, that I thought you had more sense. Allworthy resented this reflection only with a smile, nor could he, if he would have endeavoured it, have conveyed into that smile any mixture of malice or contempt. His smiles at folly were indeed such as we may suppose the angels bestow on the absurdities of mankind. Blifil now desired to be permitted to speak a few words. As to using any violence on the young lady, I am sure I shall never consent to it. My conscience will not permit me to use violence on any one, much less on a lady for whom, however cruel she is to me, I shall always preserve the purest and sincerest affection. But yet I have read that women are seldom proof against perseverance. Why may I not hope, then, by such perseverance, at last, to gain those inclinations in which for the future I shall, perhaps, have no rival? For as for this lord, Mr. Weston is so kind to prefer me to him. And sure, sir, you will not deny but that a parent hath at least a negative voice in these matters. Nay, I have heard this very young lady herself say so more than once, and declare that she thought children inexcusable, who married in direct opposition to the will of their parents. Besides, though the other ladies of the family seem to favour the pretensions of my lord, I do not find the lady herself is inclined to give him any countenance. Alas! I am too well assured she is not. I am too sensible that wickedest of men remains uppermost in her heart. Ay, ay, so he does, cries Weston. But surely, says Blifil, when she hears of this murder which he hath committed, if the law should spare his life— What's that? cries Weston. Murder? Hath he committed a murder? And is there any hopes of seeing him hanged? Toll the roll, toll all the roll. Here he fell a-singing and capering about the room. Child, says Allworthy, this unhappy passion of yours distresses me beyond measure. I heartily pity you, and would do every fair thing to promote your success. I desire no more, cries Blifil. I am convinced my dear uncle had a better opinion of me than to think that I myself would accept of more. Looky, says Allworthy, you have my leave to write, to visit, if she will permit it, but I insist on no thoughts of violence. I will have no confinement, nothing of that kind attempted. Well, well, cries the squire, nothing of that kind shall be attempted. We will try a little longer what fair means will effect, and if this fellow be but hanged out of the way, toll all the roll, I never heard better news in my life. I warrant everything goes to my mind. Do, prithee, dear Allworthy, come and dine with me at the Hercules Pillars. I have bespoke a shoulder of mutton roasted, and a spare rib of pork, and a fowl and egg sauce. There'll be nobody but ourselves, unless we have a mind to have the landlord, for I've sent Parson Supple down to Basingstoke after my tobacco-box, which I left at an inn there, and I would not lose it for the world, for it is an old acquaintance of above twenty years' standing. I can tell you the landlord is a vast comical bitch you will like and hugely. Mr. Allworthy at last agreed to this invitation, and soon after the squire went off, singing and capering at the hopes of seeing the speedy, tragical end of poor Jones. When he was gone, Mr. Allworthy resumed the aforesaid subject with much gravity. He told his nephew, he wished with all his heart he would endeavour to conquer a passion in which I cannot, says he, flatter you with any hopes of succeeding. It is certainly a vulgar error that aversion in a woman may be conquered by perseverance. Indifference may, perhaps, sometimes yield to it, but the usual triumphs gained by perseverance in a lover are over caprice, prudence, affectation, and often an exorbitant degree of levity, which excites women not over warm in their constitutions to indulge their vanity by prolonging the time of courtship, even when they are well enough pleased with the object, and resolve, if they ever resolve at all, to make him a very pitiful amends in the end. But a fixed dislike, as I am afraid this is, 
will rather gather strength than be conquered by time. Besides, my dear, I have another apprehension which you must excuse. I am afraid this passion which you have for this fine young creature hath her beautiful person too much for its object, and is unworthy of the name of that love which is the only foundation of matrimonial felicity. To admire, to like, and to long for the possession of a beautiful woman, without any regard to her sentiments towards us, is, I am afraid, too natural. But love, I believe, is a child of love only. At least, I am pretty confident that to love the creature who we are assured hates us is not in human nature. Examine your heart, therefore, thoroughly, my good boy, and if, upon examination, you have but the least suspicion of this kind, I am sure your own virtue and religion will impel you to drive so vicious a passion from your heart, and your good sense will soon enable you to do it without pain. The reader may pretty well guess Bliffle's answer but if he should be at a loss we are not at present at leisure to satisfy him as our history now hastens on to matters of higher importance and we can no longer bear to be absent from sophia End of section fifty nine section sixty of tom jones this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Book 17. Chapter 4. An extraordinary scene between Sophia and her aunt. The lowing heifer and the bleating ewe, in herds and flocks, may ramble safe and unregarded through the pastures. These are indeed hereafter doomed to be the prey of men, yet many years are they suffered to enjoy their liberty undisturbed. But if a plump doe be discovered to have escaped from the forest, and to repose herself in some field or grove, the whole parish is presently alarmed, every man is ready to set his dogs after her, and, if she is preserved from the rest by the good squire, it is only that he may secure her for his own eating. I have often considered a very fine young woman of fortune and fashion, when first found strayed from the pale of her nursery, to be in pretty much the same situation with this doe. The town is immediately in an uproar. She is hunted from park to play, from court to assembly, from assembly to her own chamber, and rarely escapes a single season from the jaws of some devourer or other. For, if her friends protect her from some, it is only to deliver her over to one of their own choosing, often more disagreeable to her than any of the rest, while whole herds or flocks of other women, securely and scarce regarded, traverse the park, the play, the opera, and the assembly and though, for the most part at least, they are at last devoured, yet for a long time do they wanton in liberty, without disturbance or control. Of all these paragons none ever tasted more of this persecution than poor Sophia. Her ill-stars were not contented with all that she had suffered on account of Bliffle, they now raised her another pursuer, who seemed likely to torment her no less than the other had done. For though her aunt was less violent, she was no less assiduous in teasing her than her father had been before. The servants were no sooner departed after dinner than Mrs. Weston, who had opened the matter to Sophia, informed her that she expected his lordship that very afternoon, and intended to take the first opportunity of leaving her alone with him. "'If you do, madam,' answered Sophia, with some spirit, "'I shall take the first opportunity of leaving him by himself.' "'How, madam?' cries the aunt. Is this the return you make me for my kindness in relieving you from your confinement at your father's? You know, madam, said Sophia, the cause of that confinement was a refusal to comply with my father in accepting a man I detested, and will my dear aunt, who hath relieved me from that distress, involve me in another, equally bad? And do you think then, madam, answered Mrs. Weston, that there is no difference between my lord Fellamar and Mr. Bliffel? Very little, in my opinion, cries Sophia and, if I must be condemned to one, I would certainly have the merit of sacrificing myself to my father's pleasure. Then my pleasure, I find, said the aunt, hath very little weight with you, but that consideration shall not move me. I act from nobler motives. The view of aggrandizing my family, of ennobling yourself, is what I proceed upon. Have you no sense of ambition? Are there no charms in the thoughts of having a coronet on your coach? None, upon my honour, said Sophia. A pincushion upon my coach would please me just as well. Never mention honour, cries the aunt. It becomes not the mouth of such a wretch. 
I am sorry, niece, you have forced me to use these words, but I cannot bear your groveling temper. You have none of the blood of the Westerns in you. But, however mean and base your own ideas are, you shall bring no imputation on mine. I will never suffer the world to say of me that I encouraged you in refusing one of the best matches in England, a match which, besides its advantage in fortune, would do honour to almost any family, and hath, indeed, in title, the advantage of ours. Surely, says Sophia, I am born deficient, and have not the senses with which other people are blessed. There must be certainly some sense which can relish the delights of sound and show, which I have not, for surely mankind would not labour so much, nor sacrifice so much for the obtaining, nor would they be so elate and proud with possessing what appeared to them, as it doth to me, the most insignificant of all trifles. No, no, miss, cries the aunt, you are born with as many senses as other people, but I assure you, you are not born with a sufficient understanding to make a fool of me, or to expose my conduct to the world. So I declare this to you, upon my word, and you know, I believe, how fixed my resolutions are. Unless you agree to see his lordship this afternoon, I will, with my own hands, deliver you to-morrow morning to my brother, and will never henceforth interfere with you, nor see your face again. Sophia stood a few moments silent after this speech, which was uttered in a most angry and peremptory tone, and then, bursting to tears, she cried, "'Do with me, madam, whatever you please. I am the most miserable, undone wretch upon earth. If my dear aunt forsakes me, where shall I look for a protector?' "'My dear niece,' cries she, "'you will have a very good protector in his lordship.' a protector whom nothing but a hankering after that vile fellow jones can make you decline indeed madam said sophia you wrong me how can you imagine after what you have shown me if i had ever any such thoughts that i should not banish them for ever if it will satisfy you i will receive the sacrament upon it never to see his face again but child dear child said the aunt be reasonable can you invent a single objection "'I have already, I think, told you a sufficient objection,' answered Sophia. "'What?' cries the aunt. "'I remember none.' "'Sure, madam,' said Sophia. "'I told you he had used me in the rudest and vilest manner.' "'Indeed, child,' answered she. "'I never heard you, or did not understand you. "'But what do you mean by this rude, vile manner?' "'Indeed, madam,' said Sophia. I am almost ashamed to tell you. He caught me in his arms, pulled me down upon the settee, and thrust his hand into my bosom, and kissed it with such violence that I have the mark upon my left breast at this moment. Indeed, said Mrs. Weston. Yes, indeed, madam, answered Sophia. My father luckily came in at that instant, or heaven knows what rudeness he intended to have proceeded to. I am astonished and confounded, cries the aunt. No woman of the name of Weston hath been ever treated so since we were a family. I would have torn the eyes of a prince out if he had attempted such freedoms with me. It is impossible. Sure, Sophia, you must invent this to raise my indignation against him. I hope, madam, said Sophia, you have too good an opinion of me to imagine me capable of telling an untruth. Upon my soul it is true. I should have stepped into the heart had I been present, returned the aunt. Yet surely he could have no dishonourable design. It is impossible. He durst not. Besides, his proposals show he hath not, for they are not only honourable, but generous. I don't know. The age allows two great freedoms. A distant salute is all I would have allowed before the ceremony. I have had lovers formerly, not so long ago neither. Several lovers, though I never would consent to marriage, and I never encouraged the least freedom." It is a foolish custom, and what I never would agree to. No man kissed more of me than my cheek. It is as much as one can bring oneself to give lips up to a husband, and indeed, could I ever have been persuaded to marry, I believe I should not have soon been brought to endure so much. You will pardon me, dear madam, said Sophia, if I make one observation. You own you have had many lovers, and the world knows it, even if you should deny it. You refuse them all, and, I am convinced, one coronet at least among them. "'You say true, dear Sophie,' answered she. "'I had once the offer of a title.' "'Why, then,' said Sophia, "'will you not suffer me to refuse this once?' "'It is true, child,' said she. "'I have refused the offer of a title, "'but it was not so good an offer, "'that is, not so very, very good an offer.' "'Yes, madam,' said Sophia, "'but you have had very great proposals "'from men of vast fortunes. "'It was not the first, nor the second, 
nor the third advantageous match that offered itself. I own it was not, said she. Well, madam, continued Sophia, and why may not I expect to have a second, perhaps better than this? You are now but a young woman, and I am convinced would not promise to yield to the first lover of fortune, nay, or of title too. I am a very young woman, and sure I need not despair. Well, my dear, dear Sophie, cries the aunt, what would you have me say? Why, I only beg that I may not be left alone, at least this evening. Grant me that, and I will submit, if you think, after what is past, I ought to see him in your company. Well, I will grant it, cries the aunt. Sophie, you know I love you, and can deny you nothing. You know the easiness of my nature. I have not always been so easy. I have been formerly thought cruel, by the man I mean. I was called the cruel Parthenissa. I have broke many a window that has had verses to the cruel Parthenissa in it. Sophie, I was never so handsome as you, and yet I had something of you formerly. I am a little altered. Kingdoms and states, as Tully Cicero says in his epistles, undergo alterations, and so must the human form. Thus runs she on for near half an hour upon herself, and her conquests, and her cruelty, till the arrival of my lord, who, after a most tedious visit, during which Mrs. Weston never once offered to leave the room, retired, not much more satisfied with the aunt than with the niece, for Sophia had brought her aunt into so excellent a temper that she consented to almost everything her niece said, and agreed that a little distant behaviour might not be improper to so forward a lover. Thus Sophia, by a little well-directed flattery, for which surely none will blame her, obtained a little ease for herself, and, at least, put off the evil day. And now we have seen our heroine in a better situation than she hath been for a long time before, we will look a little after Mr. Jones, whom we left in the most deplorable situation that can be well imagined. CHAPTER V. Mrs. Miller and Mr. Nightingale Visit Jones in the Prison when Mr. Allworthy and his nephew went to meet Mr. Weston, Mrs. Miller set forwards to her son-in-law's lodgings in order to acquaint him with the accident which had befallen his friend Jones, but he had known it long before from Partridge, for Jones, when he left Mrs. Miller, had been furnished with a room in the same house with Mr. Nightingale. The good woman found her daughter under great affliction on account of Mr. Jones, whom, having comforted as well as she could, she set forwards to the gatehouse, where she heard he was, and where Mr. Nightingale was arrived before her. The firmness and constancy of a true friend is a circumstance so extremely delightful to persons in any kind of distress, that the distress itself, if it be only temporary, and admits of relief, is more than compensated by bringing this comfort with it. Nor are instances of this kind so rare as some superficial and inaccurate observers have reported. To say the truth, want of compassion is not to be numbered among our general faults. The black ingredient which fouls our disposition is envy. Hence our eye is seldom, I am afraid, turned upward to those who are manifestly greater, better, wiser, or happier than ourselves, without some degree of malignity, while we commonly look downwards on the mean and miserable with sufficient benevolence and pity. In fact, I have remarked that most of the defects which have discovered themselves in the friendships within my observation have arisen from envy only, a hellish vice, and yet one from which I have known very few absolutely exempt but enough of a subject which, if pursued, would lead me too far. Whether it was that fortune was apprehensive lest Jones should sink under the weight of his adversity, and that she might thus lose any future opportunity of tormenting him, or whether she really abated somewhat of her severity towards him, she seemed a little to relax her persecution by sending him the company of two such faithful friends, and what is perhaps more rare, a faithful servant. For Partridge, though he had many imperfections, wanted not fidelity and though fear would not suffer him to be hanged for his master, yet the world, I believe, could not have bribed him to desert his cause. While Jones was expressing great satisfaction in the presence of his friends, Partridge brought an account that Mr. Fitzpatrick was still alive, though the surgeon declared that he had very little hopes. Upon which, Jones fetching a deep sigh, Nightingale said to him, "'My dear Tom, why should you afflict yourself so upon an accident which, whatever be the consequence, can be attended with no danger to you?' and in which your conscience cannot accuse you of having been the least to blame. If the fellow should die, what have you done more than taken away the life of a ruffian in your own defence? So will the coroner's inquest certainly find it, and then you will be easily admitted to bail. 
and, though you must undergo the form of a trial, yet it is a trial which many men would stand for you for a shilling. "'Come, come, Mr. Jones,' says Mrs. Miller. "'Cheer yourself up. I knew you could not be the aggressor, and so I told Mr. Allworthy, and so he shall acknowledge too, before I have done with him.' Jones gravely answered, "'That whatever might be his fate, he should always lament the having shed the blood of one of his fellow-creatures, as one of the highest misfortunes which could have befallen him.' but I have another misfortune of the tenderest kind. Oh, Mrs. Miller, I have lost what I held most dear upon earth. That must be a mistress, said Mrs. Miller. But come, come, I know more than you imagine. For indeed Partridge had blabbed all. And I have heard more than you know. Matters go better, I promise you, than you think, and I would not give Liffle sixpence for all the chance which he hath of the lady. Indeed, my dear friend, indeed, answered Jones, you are an entire stranger to the cause of my grief. If you was acquainted with the story, you would allow my case admitted of no comfort. I apprehend no danger from Bliffle. I have undone myself. Don't despair, replied Mrs. Miller. You know not what a woman can do, and if anything be in my power, I promise you I will do it to serve you. It is my duty. My son, my dear Mr. Nightingale, who is so kind to tell me he hath obligations to you on the same account, knows it is my duty. "'Shall I go to the lady myself? "'I will say anything to her you would have me say.' "'Thou best of women,' cries Jones, taking her by the hand, "'talk not of obligations to me, "'but, as you have been so kind to mention it, "'there is a favour which, perhaps, may be in your power. "'I see you are acquainted with the lady, "'how you came by your information I know not, "'who sits, indeed, very near my heart. "'If you could contrive to deliver this,' "'giving her a paper from his pocket, "'I shall for ever acknowledge your goodness.' "'Give it me,' said Mrs. Miller. "'If I see it not in her own possession before I sleep, may my next sleep be my last. Comfort yourself, my good young man. Be wise enough to take warning from past follies, and I warrant all shall be well, and I shall yet see you happy with the most charming young lady in the world, for I so hear from every one she is.' "'Believe me, madam,' said he, "'I do not speak the common cant of one in my unhappy situation.' Before this dreadful accident happened, I had resolved to quit a life of which I was become sensible of the wickedness as well as folly. I do assure you, notwithstanding the disturbances I have unfortunately occasioned in your house, for which I heartily ask your pardon, I am not an abandoned profligate. Though I have been hurried into vices, I do not approve a vicious character, nor will I ever, from this moment, deserve it. Mrs. Miller expressed great satisfaction in these declarations in the sincerity of which she averred she had an entire faith, and now the remainder of the conversation passed in the joint attempts of that good woman and Mr. Nightingale to cheer the dejected spirits of Mr. Jones, in which they so far succeeded as to leave him much better comforted and satisfied than they found him, to which happy alteration nothing so much contributed as the kind undertaking of Mrs. Miller to deliver his letter to Sophia, which he despaired of finding any means to accomplish for when Black George produced the last from Sophia, he informed Partridge that she had strictly charged him, on pain of having it communicated to her father, not to bring her any answer. He was, moreover, not a little pleased to find he had so warm an advocate to Mr. Allworthy himself in this good woman, who was, in reality, one of the worthiest creatures in the world. After about an hour's visit from the lady, for Nightingale had been with him much longer, they both took their leave, promising to return to him soon during which Mrs. Miller said she hoped to bring him some good news from his mistress, and Mr. Nightingale promised to inquire into the state of Mr. Fitzpatrick's wound, and likewise to find out some of the persons who were present at the recounter. The former of these went directly in quest of Sophia, whither we likewise shall now attend her. Chapter 6. In which Mrs. Miller pays a visit to Sophia. Access to the young lady was by no means difficult for, as she lived now on a perfect friendly footing with her aunt, she was at full liberty to receive what visitants she pleased. Sophia was dressing when she was acquainted that there was a gentlewoman below to wait on her. As she was neither afraid nor ashamed to see any of her own sex, Mrs. Miller was immediately admitted. Curtsies and the usual ceremonials between women who are strangers to each other being passed, Sophia said, "'I have not the pleasure to know you, madam.' "'No, madam,' said Mrs. Miller and I must beg pardon for intruding upon you. But when you know what has induced me to give you this trouble, I hope— Pray, what is your business, madam? said Sophia, with a little emotion. Madam, we are not alone, replied Mrs. Miller, in a low voice. Go out, Betty, said Sophia. 
When Betty was departed, Mrs. Miller said, "'I was desired, madam, by a very unhappy young gentleman, to deliver you this letter.' Sophia changed colour when she saw the direction, well knowing the hand, and after some hesitation said, "'I could not conceive, madam, from your appearance, that your business had been of such a nature. Whomever you brought this letter from, I shall not open it. I should be sorry to entertain an unjust suspicion of any one, but you are an utter stranger to me.' "'If you will have patience, madam,' answered Mrs. Miller, "'I will acquaint you who I am, and how I came by that letter.' "'I have no curiosity, madam, to know anything,' cries Sophia, "'but I must insist on your delivering that letter back to the person who gave it you.' Mrs. Miller then fell upon her knees, and in the most passionate terms implored her compassion, to which Sophia answered, "'Sure, madam, it is surprising you should be so very strongly interested in the behalf of this person. I would not think, madam.' "'No, madam,' says Mrs. Miller, "'you shall not think anything but the truth. I will tell you all, and you will not wonder that I am interested.' he is the best-natured creature that ever was born she then began and related the story of mr anderson after this she cried this madam this is his goodness but i have much more tender obligations to him he hath preserved my child here after shedding some tears she related everything concerning that fact suppressing only those circumstances which would have most reflected on her daughter and concluded with saying now madam you shall judge whether i can ever do enough for so kind so good so generous a young man and sure he is the best and worthiest of all human beings the alterations in the countenance of sophia had hitherto been chiefly to her disadvantage and had inclined her complexion to too great paleness but she now waxed redder if possible than vermilion and cried i know not what to say certainly what arises from gratitude cannot be blamed but what service can my reading this letter do your friend, since I am resolved never? Mrs. Miller fell again to her entreaties, and begged to be forgiven, but she could not, she said, carry it back. Well, madam, says Sophia, I cannot help it if you will force it upon me. Certainly you may leave it whether I will or no. What Sophia meant, or whether she meant anything, I will not presume to determine. But Mrs. Miller actually understood this as a hint and presently laying the letter down on the table, took her leave, having first begged permission to wait again on Sophia, which request had neither assent nor denial. The letter lay upon the table no longer than till Mrs. Miller was out of sight, for then Sophia opened and read it. This letter did very little service to his cause, for it consisted of little more than confessions of his own unworthiness, and bitter lamentations of despair, together with the most solemn protestations of his unalterable fidelity to Sophia, of which, he said, he hoped to convince her, if he had ever more the honour of being admitted to her presence, and that he could account for the letter to Lady Bellaston in such a manner that, though it would not entitle him to her forgiveness, he hoped at least to obtain it from her mercy, and concluded with vowing that nothing was ever less in his thoughts than to marry Lady Bellaston. Though Sophia read the letter twice over with great attention, his meaning still remained a riddle to her, nor could her invention suggest to her any means to excuse Jones. She certainly remained very angry with him, though indeed Lady Bellaston took up so much of her resentment that her gentle mind had but little left to bestow on any other person. That lady was most unluckily to dine this very day with her Aunt Western, and in the afternoon they were all three, by appointment, to go together to the opera, and thence to Lady Thomas Hatchet's drum. Sophia would have gladly been excused from all, but would not disoblige her aunt, and as to the arts of counterfeiting illness, she was so entirely a stranger to them, that it never once entered into her head. When she was dressed, therefore, down she went, resolved to encounter all the horrors of the day, and a most disagreeable one it proved, for Lady Bellaston took every opportunity very civilly and slyly to insult her to all which her dejection of spirits disabled her from making any return, and indeed, to confess the truth, she was at the very best but an indifferent mistress of repartee. Another misfortune which befell poor Sophia was the company of Lord Fellamar, whom she met at the opera, and who attended her to the drum, and though both places were too public to admit of any particularities, and she was farther relieved by the music at the one place, and by the cards at the other, she could not, however, enjoy herself in his company, for there is something of delicacy in women which will not suffer them to be even easy in the presence of a man whom they know to have pretensions to them which they are disinclined to favour. Having in this chapter twice mentioned a drum, 
a word which our posterity, it is hoped, will not understand in the sense it is here applied, we shall, notwithstanding our present haste, stop a moment to describe the entertainment here meant, and the rather as we can in a moment describe it. A drum, then, is an assembly of well-dressed persons of both sexes, most of whom play at cards, and the rest do nothing at all, while the mistress of the house performs the part of the landlady at an inn, and, like the landlady of an inn, prides herself in the number of her guests, though she doth not always, like her, get anything by it. No wonder, then, as so much spirits must be required to support any vivacity in these scenes of dullness, that we hear persons of fashion eternally complaining of the want of them, a complaint confined entirely to upper life. How insupportable must we imagine this round of impertinence to have been to Sophia at this time! How difficult must she have found it to force the appearance of gaiety into her looks, when her mind dictated nothing but the tenderest sorrow, and when every thought was charged with tormenting ideas. Night, however, at last restored her to her pillow, where we will leave her to soothe her melancholy at least, though incapable, we fear, of rest, and shall pursue our history, which, something whispers us, is now arrived at the eve of some great event. End of section 60 of Tom Jones Section 61 of Tom Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Book 17, Chapter 7. A Pathetic Scene Between Mr. Allworthy and Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Miller had a long discourse with Mr. Allworthy, at his return from dinner, in which she acquainted him with Jones's having unfortunately lost all which he was pleased to bestow on him at their separation, and with the distresses to which that loss had subjected him, of all which she had received a full account from the faithful retailer Partridge. She then explained the obligations she had to Jones, not that she was entirely explicit with regard to her daughter for though she had the utmost confidence in Mr. Allworthy, and though there could be no hopes of keeping an affair secret which was unhappily known to more than half a dozen, yet she could not prevail with herself to mention those circumstances which reflected most on the chastity of poor Nancy, but smothered that part of her evidence as cautiously as if she had been before a judge, and the girl was now on her trial for the murder of a bastard. Allworthy said there were few characters so absolutely vicious as not to have the least mixture of good in them. However, says he, I cannot deny but that you have some obligations to the fellow, bad as he is, and I shall therefore excuse what hath passed already, but must insist you never mention his name to me more. For, I promise you, it was upon the fullest and plainest evidence that I resolved to take the measures I have taken. Well, sir, says she, I make not the least doubt, but time will show all matters in their true and natural colours, and that you will be convinced this poor young man deserves better of you than some other folks that shall be nameless. Madam, cries Allworthy, a little ruffled, I will not hear any reflections on my nephew, and if ever you say a word more of that kind, I will depart from your house that instant. He is the worthiest and best of men, and I once more repeat it to you, he hath carried his friendship to this man to a blamable length by too long concealing facts of the blackest dye. The ingratitude of the wretch to this good young man is what I most resent. For, madam, I have the greatest reason to imagine he had laid a plot to supplant my nephew in my favour, and to have disinherited him. I am sure, sir, answered Mrs. Miller, a little frightened, for, though Mr. Allworthy had the utmost sweetness and benevolence in his smiles, he had great terror in his frowns. I shall never speak against any gentleman you are pleased to think well of. I am sure, sir, such behaviour would very little become me, especially when the gentleman is your nearest relation. But, sir, you must not be angry with me, you must not indeed, for my good wishes to this poor wretch. Sure I may call him so now, though once you would have been angry with me if I had spoke of him with the least disrespect. How often have I heard you call him your son? How often have you prattled to me of him with all the fondness of a parent? Nay, sir, I cannot forget the many tender expressions, the many good things that you have told me of his beauty, and his parts, and his virtues, of his good nature and generosity. I am sure, sir, I cannot forget them, for I find them all true. I have experienced them in my own cause. They have preserved my family. You must pardon my tears, sir, indeed you must. When I consider the cruel reverse of fortune which this poor youth, to whom I am so much obliged, hath suffered, 
when I consider the loss of your favour, which I know he valued more than his life, I must, I must lament him. If you had a dagger in your hand, ready to plunge into my heart, I must lament the misery of one whom you have loved, and I shall ever love. Allworthy was pretty much moved with this speech, but it seemed not to be with anger, for, after a short silence, taking Mrs. Miller by the hand, he said very affectionately to her, "'Come, madam, let us consider a little about your daughter. I cannot blame you for rejoicing in a match which promises to be advantageous to her, but you know this advantage, in a great measure, depends on the father's reconciliation. I know Mr. Nightingale very well, and have formerly had concerns with him. I will make him a visit, and endeavour to serve you in this matter. I believe he is a worldly man, but as this is an only son, and the thing is now irretrievable, perhaps he may in time be brought to reason. I promise you I will do all I can for you. Many were the acknowledgments which the poor woman made to Allworthy for this kind and generous offer, nor could she refrain from taking this occasion again to express her gratitude towards Jones. To whom, said she, I owe the opportunity of giving you, sir, this present trouble. Allworthy gently stopped her but he was too good a man to be really offended with the effects of so noble a principle as now actuated Mrs. Miller. And, indeed, had not this new affair inflamed his former anger against Jones, it is possible he might have been a little softened towards him, by the report of an action which malice itself could not have derived from an evil motive. Mr. Allworthy and Mrs. Miller had been above an hour together, when their conversation was put an end to by the arrival of Bliffle and another person, which other person was no less than Mr. Dowling, the attorney, who was now become a great favourite with Mr. Bliffle, and who Mr. Allworthy, at the desire of his nephew, had made his steward, and had likewise recommended him to Mr. Weston, from whom the attorney received a promise of being promoted to the same office upon the first vacancy, and, in the meantime, was employed in transacting some affairs which the squire then had in London in relation to a mortgage. This was the principal affair which then brought Mr. Dowling to town, Therefore he took the same opportunity to charge himself with some money for Mr. Allworthy, and to make a report to him of some other business, in all which, as it was of much too dull a nature to find any place in this history, we will leave the uncle, nephew, and their lawyer concerned, and resort to other matters. CHAPTER Eight, CONTAINING VARIOUS MATTERS Before we return to Jones, we will take one more view of Sophia. Though that young lady had brought her aunt into great good humour by those soothing methods which we have before related, she had not brought her in the least to abate of her zeal for the match with Lord Fellamar. This zeal was now inflamed by Lady Bellaston, who had told her the preceding evening that she was well satisfied from the conduct of Sophia, and from her carriage to his lordship, that all delays would be dangerous, and that the only way to succeed was to press the match forward with such rapidity that the young lady should have no time to reflect, and be obliged to consent while she scarce knew what she did. In which manner, she said, one half of the marriages among people of condition were brought about. A fact very probably true, and to which, I suppose, is owing the mutual tenderness which afterwards exists among so many happy couples. A hint of the same kind was given by the same lady to Lord Fellamar and both these so readily embraced the advice that the very next day was, at his lordship's request, appointed by Mrs. Weston for a private interview between the young parties. This was communicated to Sophia by her aunt, and insisted upon in such high terms that, after having urged everything she possibly could invent against it without the least effect, she at last agreed to give the highest instance of complaisance which any young lady can give, and consented to see his lordship. As conversations of this kind afford no great entertainment, we shall be excused from reciting the whole that passed at this interview, in which, after his lordship had made many declarations of the most pure and ardent passion to the silent, blushing Sophia, she at last collected all the spirits she could raise, and with a trembling, low voice said, "'My lord, you must be yourself conscious whether your former behaviour to me hath been consistent with the professions you now make.' "'Is there,' answered he, "'no way by which I can atone for madness. "'What I did, I am afraid, must have too plainly convinced you "'that the violence of love had deprived me of my senses.' "'Indeed, my lord,' said she, "'it is in your power to give me a proof of an affection "'which I much rather wish to encourage, "'and to which I should think myself more beholden.' "'Name it, madam,' said my lord, very warmly. "'My lord,' said she, looking down upon her fan. I know you must be sensible how uneasy this pretended passion of yours hath made me. 
"'Can you be so cruel to call it pretended?' says he. "'Yes, my lord,' answered Sophia. "'All professions of love to those whom we persecute are most insulting pretenses. "'This pursuit of yours is to me a most cruel persecution. "'Nay, it is taking a most ungenerous advantage of my unhappy situation.' "'Most lovely, most adorable charmer, do not accuse me,' cries he, "'of taking an ungenerous advantage, while I have no thoughts but what are directed to your honour and interest, and while I have no view, no hope, no ambition, but to throw myself, honour, fortune, everything at your feet.' "'My lord,' says she, "'it is that fortune and those honours which gave you the advantage of which I complain.' These are the charms which have seduced my relations, but to me they are things indifferent. If your lordship will merit my gratitude, there is but one way. Pardon me, divine creature, said he. There can be none. All I can do for you is so much your due, and will give me so much pleasure, that there is no room for your gratitude. Indeed, my lord, answered she, you may obtain my gratitude, my good opinion, every kind thought and wish which it is in my power to bestow. Nay, you may attain them with ease, for sure to a generous mind it must be easy to grant my request. Let me beseech you, then, to seize a pursuit in which you can never have any success. For your own sake, as well as mine, I entreat this favour, for sure you are too noble to have any pleasure in tormenting an unhappy creature. What can your lordship propose but uneasiness to yourself, by a perseverance which, upon my honour, upon my soul, cannot, shall not prevail with me? whatever distresses you may drive me to. Here my lord fetched a deep sigh, and then said, Is it then, madam, that I am so unhappy to be the object of your dislike and scorn, or will you pardon me if I suspect there is some other? Here he hesitated, and Sophia answered with some spirit, My lord, I shall not be accountable to you for the reasons of my conduct. I am obliged to your lordship for the generous offer you have made. I own it is beyond either my deserts or expectations. Yet I hope, my lord, you will not insist on my reasons, when I declare I cannot accept it. Lord Fellamar returned much to this, which we do not perfectly understand, and perhaps it could not all be strictly reconciled either to sense or grammar, but he concluded his ranting speech with saying that if she had pre-engaged herself to any gentleman, however unhappy it would make him, he should think himself bound in honour to desist. Perhaps my lord laid too much emphasis on the word gentleman, for we cannot else well account for the indignation with which he inspired Sophia, who, in her answer, seemed greatly to resent some affront he had given her. While she was speaking, with her voice more raised than usual, Mrs. Weston came into the room, the fire glaring in her cheeks, and the flames bursting from her eyes. "'I am ashamed,' says she, my lord, of the reception which you have met with. I assure your lordship we are all sensible of the honour done us, and I must tell you, Miss Weston, the family expect a different behaviour from you. Here my lord interfered on behalf of the young lady, but to no purpose. The aunt proceeded, till Sophia pulled out her handkerchief, threw herself into a chair, and burst into a violent fit of tears. The remainder of the conversation between Mrs. Weston and his lordship, till the latter withdrew, consisted of bitter lamentations on his side and on hers of the strongest assurances that her niece should and would consent to all he wished. "'Indeed, my lord,' says she, "'the girl hath had a foolish education, neither adapted to her fortune nor her family. Her father, I am sorry to say it, is to blame for everything. The girl hath silly country notions of bashfulness. Nothing else, my lord, upon my honour. I am convinced she hath a good understanding at the bottom, and will be brought to reason.' This last speech was made in the absence of Sophia for she had some time before left the room, with more appearance of passion than she had ever shown on any occasion, and now his lordship, after many expressions of thanks to Mrs. Weston, many ardent professions of passion which nothing could conquer, and many assurances of perseverance which Mrs. Weston highly encouraged, took his leave for this time. Before we relate what now passed between Mrs. Weston and Sophia, it may be proper to mention an unfortunate accident which had happened, and which had occasioned the return of Mrs. Weston with so much fury as we have seen. The reader, then, must know that the maid who at present attended on Sophia was recommended by Lady Bellaston, with whom she had lived for some time in the capacity of a comb-brush. She was a very sensible girl, and had received the strictest instructions to watch her young lady very carefully. These instructions, we are sorry to say, were communicated to her by Mrs. Honour 
into whose favour Lady Bellaston had now so ingratiated herself that the violent affection which the good waiting-woman had formerly borne to Sophia was entirely obliterated by that great attachment which she had to her new mistress. Now, when Mrs. Miller was departed, Betty, for that was the name of the girl, returning to her young lady, found her very attentively engaged in reading a long letter, and the visible emotions which she betrayed on that occasion might have well accounted for some suspicions which the girl entertained. But indeed they had yet a stronger foundation, for she had overheard the whole scene which passed between Sophia and Mrs. Miller. Mrs. Weston was acquainted with all this matter by Betty, who, after receiving many commendations and some rewards for her fidelity, was ordered that, if the woman who brought the letter came again, she should introduce her to Mrs. Weston herself. Unluckily, Mrs. Miller returned at the very time when Sophia was engaged with his lordship. Betty, according to order, sent her directly to the aunt, who, being mistress of so many circumstances relating to what had passed the day before, easily imposed upon the poor woman to believe that Sophia had communicated the whole affair, and so pumped everything out of her which she knew relating to the letter and relating to Jones. This poor creature might, indeed, be called simplicity itself. She was one of that order of mortals who were apt to believe everything which is said to them, to whom nature had neither indulged the offensive nor defensive weapons of deceit, and who are consequently liable to be imposed upon by any who will only be at the expense of a little falsehood for that purpose. Mrs. Weston, having drained Mrs. Miller of all she knew, which indeed was but little, but which was sufficient to make the aunt suspect a great deal, dismissed her with assurances that Sophia would not see her, that she would send no answer to the letter, nor ever receive another, nor did she suffer her to depart without a handsome lecture on the merits of an office to which she could afford no better name than that of Procurus. This discovery had greatly discomposed her temper when, coming into the apartment next to that in which the lovers were, she overheard Sophia very warmly protesting against his lordship's addresses, at which the rage already kindled burst forth, and she rushed in upon her niece in a most furious manner, as we have already described, together with what passed at that time till his lordship's departure. No sooner was Lord Fellamar gone than Mrs. Weston returned to Sophia, whom she upbraided in the most bitter terms for the ill use she had made of the confidence reposed in her and for her treachery in conversing with a man with whom she had offered but the day before to bind herself in the most solemn oath never more to have any conversation. Sophia protested she had maintained no such conversation. "'How, how, Miss Weston,' said the aunt, "'will you deny your receiving a letter from him yesterday?' "'A letter, madam,' answered Sophia, somewhat surprised. "'It is not very well bred, miss,' replies the aunt, "'to repeat my words.' I say a letter, and I insist upon your showing it me immediately. I scorn a lie, madam, said Sophia. I did receive a letter, but it was without my desire, and, indeed, I may say, against my consent. Indeed, indeed, miss, cries the aunt, you ought to be ashamed of owning you had received it at all. But where is the letter? For I will see it. To this peremptory demand, Sophia passed some time before she returned an answer and at last only excused herself by declaring she had not the letter in her pocket, which was indeed true, upon which her aunt, losing all manner of patience, asked her niece this short question, whether she would resolve to marry Lord Fellamar or no, to which she received the strongest negative. Mrs. Weston then replied with an oath, or something very like one, that she would early the next morning deliver her back into her father's hand. Sophia then began to reason with her aunt in the following manner. Why, madam, must I of necessity be forced to marry at all? Consider how cruel you would have thought it in your own case, and how much kinder your parents were in leaving you to your liberty. What have I done to forfeit this liberty? I will never marry contrary to my father's consent, nor without asking yours. And when I ask the consent of either improperly, it will be then time enough to force some other marriage upon me. Can I bear to hear this? cries Mrs. Weston from a girl who had now a letter from a murderer in her pocket. "'I have no such letter, I promise you,' answered Sophia. "'And, if he be a murderer, he will soon be in no condition to give you any further disturbance.' "'How, Miss Weston,' said the aunt, "'have you the assurance to speak of him in this manner, to own your affection for such a villain to my face?' "'Sure, madam,' said Sophia, "'you put a very strange construction on my words.' "'Indeed, Miss Weston,' cries the lady, I shall not bear this usage. You have learned of your father this manner of treating me. He hath taught you to give me the lie. 
he had totally ruined you by this false system of education, and, please heaven, he shall have the comfort of its fruits, for once more I declare to you that to-morrow morning I will carry you back, I will withdraw all my forces from the field, and remain henceforth, like the wise king of Prussia, in a state of perfect neutrality. You are both too wise to be regulated by my measures, so prepare yourself, for to-morrow morning you shall evacuate this house. Sophia remonstrated all she could, but her aunt was deaf to all she said. In this resolution, therefore, we must at present leave her, and there seems to be no hopes of bringing her to change it. Chapter 9 What Happened to Mr. Jones in the Prison Mr. Jones passed about twenty-four melancholy hours by himself, unless when relieved by the company of Partridge, before Mr. Nightingale returned. Not that this worthy young man had deserted or forgot his friend, for, indeed, he had been much the greatest part of the time employed in his service. He had heard upon inquiry that the only persons who had seen the beginning of the unfortunate rencounter were a crew belonging to a man-of-war which then lay at Deptford. To Deptford, therefore, he went in search of this crew, where he was informed that the men he sought after were all gone ashore. He then traced them from place to place, till at last he found two of them drinking together, with a third person, at a hatch tavern near Aldersgate. Nightingale desired to speak with Jones by himself, for Partridge was in the room when he came in. As soon as they were alone, Nightingale, taking Jones by the hand, cried, "'Come, my brave friend, be not too much dejected at what I am going to tell you. I am sorry I am the messenger of bad news, but I think it my duty to tell you.' "'I guess already what that bad news is,' cries Jones. "'The poor gentleman, then, is dead.' "'I hope not,' answered Nightingale. "'He was alive this morning, though I will not flatter you. I fear from the accounts I could get that his wound is mortal. But if the affair be exactly as you told it, your own remorse would be all you would have reason to apprehend, let what would happen. But forgive me, my dear Tom, if I entreat you to make the worst of your story to your friends.' If you disguise anything to us, you will only be an enemy to yourself. "'What reason, my dear Jack, have I ever given you,' said Jones, "'to stab me with so cruel a suspicion?' "'Have patience,' cries Nightingale, "'and I will tell you all. After the most diligent inquiry I could make, I at last met with two of the fellows who were present at this unhappy accident, and I am sorry to say they do not relate the story so much in your favour as you yourself have told it. "'Why, what do they say?' cries Jones. Indeed, what I am sorry to repeat, as I am afraid of the consequences of it to you. They say that they were at too great a distance to overhear any words that passed between you, but they both agree that the first blow was given by you. Then, upon my soul, answered Jones, they injure me. He not only struck me first, but struck me without the least provocation. What should induce those villains to accuse me falsely? Nay, that I cannot guess, said Nightingale and if you yourself and I, who am so heartily your friend, cannot conceive a reason why they should belie you, what reason will an indifferent court of justice be able to assign why they should not believe them? I repeated the question to them several times, and so did another gentleman who was present, who, I believe, is a seafaring man, and who really acted a very friendly part by you, for he begged them often to consider that there was the life of a man in the case, and asked them over and over if they were certain to which they both answered that they were, and would abide by their evidence upon oath. For heaven's sake, my dear friend, recollect yourself, for, if this should appear to be the fact, it will be your business to think in time of making the best of your interest. I would not shock you, but you know, I believe, the severity of the law, whatever verbal provocations may have been given you. Alas, my friend, cries Jones, what interest hath such a wretch as I? Besides, do you think I would even wish to live with the reputation of a murderer? If I had any friends, as, alas, I have none, could I have the confidence to solicit them to speak in the behalf of a man condemned for the blackest crime in human nature? Believe me, I have no such hope, but I have some reliance on a throne still greatly superior, which will, I am certain, afford me all the protection I merit. He then concluded with many solemn and vehement protestations of the truth of what he had at first asserted. The faith of Nightingale was now again staggered, and began to incline to credit his friend when Mrs. Miller appeared, and made a sorrowful report of the success of her embassy, which, when Jones had heard, he cried out most heroically, "'Well, my friend, I am now indifferent, 
as to what shall happen, at least with regard to my life, and if it be the will of heaven that I shall make an atonement with that for the blood I have spilt, I hope the divine goodness will one day suffer my honour to be cleared, and that the words of a dying man at least will be believed, so far as to justify his character. A very mournful scene now passed between the prisoner and his friends, at which, as few readers would have been pleased to be present, so few, I believe, will desire to hear it particularly related. We will, therefore, pass on to the entrance of the turnkey, who acquainted Jones that there was a lady without who desired to speak with him when he was at leisure. Jones declared his surprise at this message. He said he knew no lady in the world whom he could possibly expect to see there. However, as he saw no reason to decline seeing any person, Mrs. Miller and Mr. Nightingale presently took their leave, and he gave orders to have the lady admitted. If Jones was surprised at the news of a visit from a lady, how greatly was he astonished when he discovered this lady to be no other than Mrs. Waters! In this astonishment, then, we shall leave him a while, in order to cure the surprise of the reader, who will likewise, probably, not a little wonder at the arrival of this lady. Who this Mrs. Waters was, the reader pretty well knows. What she was, he must be perfectly satisfied. He will therefore be pleased to remember that this lady departed from Upton in the same coach with Mr. Fitzpatrick and the other Irish gentlemen, and in their company travelled to Bath. Now, there was a certain office in the gift of Mr. Fitzpatrick at that time vacant, namely that of a wife, for the lady who had lately filled that office had resigned, or at least deserted her duty. Mr. Fitzpatrick, therefore, having thoroughly examined Mrs. Waters on the road, found her extremely fit for the place, which, on their arrival at Bath, he presently conferred upon her, and she, without any scruple, accepted. As husband and wife, this gentleman and lady continued together all the time they stayed at Bath, and as husband and wife they arrived together in town. Whether Mr. Fitzpatrick was so wise a man as not to part with one good thing till he had secured another, which he had at present only a prospect of regaining, or whether Mrs. Waters had so well discharged her office that he intended still to retain her as principal, and to make his wife, as is often the case, only her deputy, I will not say, but certain it is he never mentioned his wife to her, never communicated to her the letter given him by Mrs. Weston, nor even once hinted his purpose of repossessing his wife, much less did he ever mention the name of Jones for though he intended to fight with him wherever he met him he did not imitate those prudent persons who think a wife a mother a sister or sometimes a whole family the safest seconds on these occasions the first account therefore which she had of all this was delivered to her from his lips after he was brought home from the tavern where his wound had been dressed as mr fitzpatrick however had not the clearest way of telling a story at any time and was now, perhaps, a little more confused than usual, it was some time before she discovered that the gentleman who had given him this wound was the very same person from whom her heart had received a wound, which, though not of a mortal kind, was yet so deep that it had left a considerable scar behind it. But no sooner was she acquainted that Mr. Jones himself was the man who had been committed to the gatehouse for this supposed murder, than she took the first opportunity of committing Mr. Fitzpatrick to the care of his nurse, and hastened away to visit the conqueror. She now entered the room with an air of gaiety, which received an immediate check from the melancholy aspect of poor Jones, who started and blessed himself when he saw her, upon which she said, "'Nay, I do not wonder at your surprise. I believe you did not expect to see me, for few gentlemen are troubled here with visits from any lady unless a wife. You see the power you have over me, Mr. Jones. Indeed, I little thought, when we parted at Upton, that our next meeting would have been in such a place. Indeed, madam, says Jones, I must look upon this visit as kind. Few will follow the miserable, especially to such dismal habitations. I protest, Mr. Jones, says she. I can hardly persuade myself you are the same agreeable fellow I saw at Upton. Why, your face is more miserable than any dungeon in the universe. What can be the matter with you? I thought, madam, said Jones, as you knew of my being here, you knew the unhappy reason. Pah, said she, you've pinked a man in a duel, that's all. Jones expressed some indignation at this levity, and spoke with the utmost contrition for what had happened, to which she answered, well then, sir, if you take it so much to heart, I will relieve you. 
The gentleman is not dead, and, I am pretty confident, is in no danger of dying. The surgeon, indeed, who first dressed him was a young fellow, and seemed desirous of representing his case to be as bad as possible, that he might have the more honour from curing him. But the king's surgeon hath seen him since, and says, unless from a fever, of which there are at present no symptoms, he apprehends not the least danger of life. Jones showed great satisfaction in his countenance at this report, upon which he affirmed the truth of it, adding, By the most extraordinary accident in the world I lodge at the same house, and have seen the gentleman, and I promise you he doth you justice, and says, whatever be the consequence, that he was entirely the aggressor, and that you was not in the least to blame. Jones expressed the utmost satisfaction at the account which Mrs. Waters brought him. He then informed her of many things which she well knew before, as who Mr. Fitzpatrick was, the occasion of his resentment, etc. He likewise told her several facts of which she was ignorant, as the adventure of the muff, and other particulars, concealing only the name of Sophia. He then lamented the follies and vices of which he had been guilty, every one of which, he said, had been attended with such ill consequences that he should be unpardonable if he did not take warning and quit those vicious courses for the future. He lastly concluded with assuring her of his resolution to sin no more, lest a worse thing should happen to him. Mrs. Waters, with great pleasantry, ridiculed all this as the effects of low spirits and confinement. She repeated some witticisms about the devil when he was sick, and told him she doubted not but shortly to see him at liberty, and as lively a fellow as ever. And then, says she, I don't question but your conscience will be safely delivered of all these qualms that it is now so sick in breeding. Many more things of this kind she uttered, some of which it would do her no great honour in the opinion of some readers to remember nor are we quite certain but that the answers made by Jones would be treated with ridicule by others. We shall therefore suppress the rest of this conversation, and only observe that it ended at last with perfect innocence, and much more to the satisfaction of Jones than of the lady, for the former was greatly transported with the news she had brought him. But the latter was not altogether so pleased with the penitential behaviour of a man whom she had, at her first interview, conceived a very different opinion of from what she now entertained of him. Thus the melancholy occasioned by the report of Mr. Nightingale was pretty well faced, but the dejection into which Mrs. Miller had thrown him still continued. The account she gave so well tallied with the words of Sophia herself in her letter, that he made not the least doubt but that she had disclosed his letter to her aunt, and had taken a fixed resolution to abandon him. The torments this thought gave him were to be equalled only by a piece of news which fortune had yet in store for him, and which we shall communicate in the second chapter of the ensuing book. End of Book 17「Section 62 of Tom Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Book 18, containing about six days. Chapter 1. A Farewell to the Reader. We are now, reader, arrived at the last stage of our long journey. As we have, therefore, travelled together through so many pages, let us behave to one another like fellow travellers in a stage-coach, who have passed several days in the company of each other, and who, notwithstanding any bickerings or little animosities which may have occurred on the road, generally make all up at last, and mount, for the last time, into their vehicle with cheerfulness and good humour, since, after this one stage, it may possibly happen to us, as it commonly happens to them, never to meet more." As I have here taken up this simile, give me leave to carry it a little farther. I intend, then, in this last book, to imitate the good company I have mentioned in their last journey. Now it is well known that all jokes and raillery are at this time laid aside. Whatever characters any of the passengers have for the jest's sake personated on the road are now thrown off, and the conversation is usually plain and serious. In the same manner, if I have now and then, in the course of this work, indulged any pleasantry for thy entertainment, I shall here lay it down. 
The variety of matter, indeed, which I shall be obliged to cram into this book, will afford no room for any of those ludicrous observations which I have elsewhere made, and which may sometimes, perhaps, have prevented thee from taking a nap when it was beginning to steal upon thee. In this last book thou wilt find nothing, or at most very little, of that nature. All will be plain narrative only, and, indeed, when thou hast perused the many great events which this book will produce, thou wilt think the number of pages contained in it scarce sufficient to tell the story. And now, my friend, I take this opportunity, as I shall have no other, of heartily wishing thee well. If I have been an entertaining companion to thee, I promise thee it is what I have desired. If in anything I have offended, it was really without any intention. Some things, perhaps, here said, may have hit thee or thy friends, but I do most solemnly declare that they were not pointed at thee or them. I question not, but thou hast been told, among other stories of me, that thou wast to travel with a very scurrilous fellow. But whoever told thee so did me an injury. No man detests and despises scurrility more than myself, nor hath any man more reason, for none hath ever been treated with more and what is a very severe fate, I have had some of the abusive writings of those very men fathered upon me, who, in other of their works, have abused me themselves with the utmost virulence. All these works, however, I am well convinced, will be dead long before this page shall offer itself to thy perusal. For however short the period may be of my own performances, they will most probably outlive their own infirm author." and the weekly productions of his abusive contemporaries. Chapter 2 Containing a Very Tragical Incident While Jones was employed in those unpleasant meditations with which we left him tormenting himself, Partridge came stumbling into the room with his face paler than ashes, his eyes fixed in his head, his hair standing an end, and every limb trembling. In short, he looked as he would have done had he seen his spectre, or had he, indeed, been a spectre himself? Jones, who was little subject to fear, could not avoid being somewhat shocked at this sudden appearance. He did, indeed, himself change colour, and his voice a little faltered while he asked him what was the matter. "'I hope, sir,' said Partridge, "'you will not be angry with me. Indeed, I did not listen, but I was obliged to stay in the outward room. I am sure I wish I had been a hundred miles off, rather than have heard what I have heard.' "'Why, what is the matter?' said Jones. "'The matter, sir! Oh, good heaven!' answered Partridge. "'Was that woman who has just gone out, the woman who is with you at Upton?' "'She was, Partridge,' cried Jones. "'And did you really, sir, go to bed with that woman?' said he, trembling. "'I'm afraid what passed between us is no secret,' said Jones. "'Nay, but pray, sir, for heaven's sake, sir, answer me.' cries Partridge. "'You know I did,' cries Jones. "'Why, then, the Lord have mercy upon your soul, and forgive you,' cries Partridge. "'But as sure as I stand here alive, you have been abed with your own mother.' Upon these words Jones became in a moment a greater picture of horror than Partridge himself. He was, indeed, for some time struck dumb with amazement, and both stood staring wildly at each other. At last his words found way, and in an interrupted voice he said, "'How? How? What's this you tell me?' "'Nay, sir,' cries Partridge, "'I have not breath enough left to tell you now, but what I have said is most certainly true. That woman who now went out is your own mother. How unlucky was it for you, sir, that I did not happen to see her at that time to have prevented it. Sure the devil himself must have contrived to bring about this wickedness.' Sure, cries Jones, fortune will never have done with me till she hath driven me to distraction. But why do I blame fortune? I am myself the cause of all my misery. All the dreadful mischiefs which have befallen me are the consequences only of my own folly and vice. What thou hast told me, Partridge, hath almost deprived me of my senses. And was Mrs. Waters, then? But why do I ask? For thou must certainly know her." If thou hast any affection for me, nay, if thou hast any pity, let me beseech thee to fetch this miserable woman back again to me. Oh, good heavens! Incest! With a mother! To what am I reserved? He then fell into the most violent and frantic agonies of grief and despair, in which Partridge declared he would not leave him. 
But at last, having vented the first torrent of passion, he came a little to himself, and then, having acquainted Partridge that he would find this wretched woman in the same house where the wounded gentleman was lodged, he dispatched him in quest of her. If the reader will please to refresh his memory by turning to the scene at Upton, in the ninth book, he will be apt to admire the many strange accidents which unfortunately prevented any interview between Partridge and Mrs. Waters, when she spent a whole day there with Mr. Jones. Instances of this kind we may frequently observe in life, where the greatest events are produced by a nice train of little circumstances, and more than one example of this may be discovered by the accurate eye in this our history. After a fruitless search of two or three hours, Partridge returned back to his master, without having seen Mrs. Waters. Jones, who was in a state of desperation at his delay, was almost raving mad when he brought him his account. He was not long, however, in this condition, before he received the following letter. Sir, since I left you I have seen a gentleman, from whom I have learned something concerning you which greatly surprises and affects me, but as I have not at present leisure to communicate a matter of such high importance, you must suspend your curiosity till our next meeting, which shall be the first moment I am able to see you. Oh, Mr. Jones, little did I think, when I passed that happy day at Upton, the reflection upon which is like to embitter all my future life, who it was to whom I owed such perfect happiness. Believe me to be ever sincerely your unfortunate J. Waters. P.S. I would have you comfort yourself as much as possible, for Mr. Fitzpatrick is in no manner of danger, so that whatever other grievous crimes you may have to repent of, the guild of blood is not among the number. Jones, having read the letter, let it drop, for he was unable to hold it, and indeed had scarce the use of any one of his faculties. Partridge took it up, and having received consent by silence, read it likewise, nor had it upon him a less sensible effect. The pencil, and not the pen, should describe the horrors which appeared in both their countenances. While they both remained speechless, the turnkey entered the room, and, without taking any notice of what sufficiently discovered itself in the faces of them both, acquainted Jones that a man without desired to speak with him. This person was presently introduced, and was no other than Black George. As sights of horror were not so usual to George as they were to the turnkey, he instantly saw the great disorder which appeared in the face of Jones. This he imputed to the accident that had happened, which was reported in the very worst light in Mr. Weston's family. He concluded, therefore, that the gentleman was dead, and that Mr. Jones was in a fair way of coming to a shameful end, a thought which gave him much uneasiness, for George was of a compassionate disposition, and notwithstanding a small breach of friendship which he had been over-tempted to commit, was, in the main, not insensible of the obligations he had formerly received from Mr. Jones. The poor fellow, therefore, scarce refrained from a tear at the present sight. He told Jones he was heartily sorry for his misfortunes, and begged him to consider if he could be of any manner of service. "'Perhaps, sir,' said he, "'you may want a little matter of money upon this occasion. If you do, sir, what little I have is heartily at your service.' Jones shook him very heartily by the hand, and gave him many thanks for the kind offer he had made, but answered, "'He had not the least want of that kind,' upon which George began to press his services more eagerly than before." Jones again thanked him, with assurances that he wanted nothing which was in the power of any man living to give. "'Come, come, my good master,' answered George. "'Do not take the matter so much to heart. Things may end better than you imagine. To be sure, you ain't the first gentleman who had killed a man, and yet come off.' "'You're wide of the matter, George,' said Partridge. "'The gentleman is not dead, nor like to die. Don't disturb my master at present.' for he is troubled about a matter in which it is not in your power to do him any good. "'You don't know what I may be able to do, Mr. Partridge,' answered George. "'If his concern is about my young lady, I have some news to tell my master.' "'What do you say, Mr. George?' cried Jones. "'Hath anything lately happened in which my Sophia is concerned? "'My Sophia! How dares such a wretch as I mention her so profanely?' "'I hope she will be yours yet,' answered George. Why, yes, sir, I have something to tell you about her. Madam Weston hath just brought Madam Sophia home, and there hath been a terrible to do. I could not possibly learn the very right of it, but my master, he hath been in a vast big passion, and so was Madam Weston, and I heard her say, as she went out of doors into her chair, that she would never set her foot in master's house again. 
I don't know what's the matter, not I, but everything was very quiet when I came out. But Robin, who waited at supper, said he had never seen the squire for a long while in such good humour with young madam, that he kissed her several times, and swore she should be her own mistress, and he never would think of confining her any more. I thought this news would please you, and so I slipped out, though it was so late, to inform you of it. Mr. Jones assured George that it did greatly please him, for though he should never more presume to lift his eyes toward that incomparable creature, nothing could so much relieve his misery as the satisfaction he should always have in hearing of her welfare. The rest of the conversation which passed at the visit is not important enough to be here related. The reader will, therefore, forgive us this abrupt breaking off, and be pleased to hear how this great good will of the squire towards his daughter was brought about. Mrs. Weston, on her first arrival at her brother's lodging, began to set forth the great honours and advantages which would accrue to the family by the match with Lord Fellamar, which her niece had absolutely refused, in which refusal, when the squire took the part of his daughter, she fell immediately into the most violent passion, and so irritated and provoked the squire, that neither his patience nor his prudence could bear it any longer upon which there ensued between them both so warm about at altercation that perhaps the regions of billingsgate never equalled it in the heat of this scolding mrs weston departed and had consequently no leisure to acquaint her brother with the letter which sophia received which might have possibly produced ill effects but to say truth i believe it never once occurred to her memory at this time when Mrs. Weston was gone, Sophia, who had been hitherto silent, as well indeed from necessity as inclination, began to return the compliment which her father had made her, in taking her part against her aunt, by taking his likewise against the lady. This was the first time of her so doing, and it was in the highest degree acceptable to the squire. Again he remembered that Mr. Allworthy had insisted on an entire relinquishment of all violent means. And, indeed, as he made no doubt but that Jones would be hanged, he did not in the least question succeeding with his daughter by fair means. He now, therefore, once more gave a loose to his natural fondness for her, which had such an effect on the dutiful, grateful, tender, and affectionate heart of Sophia, that had her honour given to Jones, and something else, perhaps, in which he was concerned, been removed, I much doubt whether she would not have sacrificed herself to a man she did not like, to have obliged her father. She promised him she would make it the whole business of her life to oblige him, and would never marry any man against his consent. Which brought the old man so near to his highest happiness, that he was resolved to take the other step, and went to bed completely drunk. CHAPTER three. Allworthy visits old Nightingale, with a strange discovery that he made on that occasion. The morning after these things had happened, Mr. Allworthy went, according to his promise, to visit old Nightingale, with whom his authority was so great that, after having sat with him three hours, he at last prevailed with him to consent to see his son. Here an accident happened of a very extraordinary kind, one, indeed, of those strange chances whence very good and grave men have concluded that providence often interposes in the discovery of the most secret villainy, in order to caution men from quitting the paths of honesty however warily they tread in those of vice. Mr. Allworthy, at his entrance into Mr. Nightingale's, saw Black George. He took no notice of him, nor did Black George imagine he had perceived him. However, when their conversation on the principal point was over, Allworthy asked Nightingale whether he knew one George Seagram, and upon what business he came to his house. "'Yes,' answered Nightingale, "'I know him very well, and a most extraordinary fellow he is.' who, in these days, hath been able to hold up five hundred pounds from renting a very small estate of thirty pounds a year. "'And is this the story which he hath told you?' cries Allworthy. "'Nay, it is true, I promise you,' said Nightingale, "'for I have the money now in my own hands, in five bank-bills, which I am to lay out either in a mortgage or in some purchase in the north of England.' The bank-bills were no sooner produced at Allworthy's desire than he blessed himself at the strangeness of the discovery. He presently told Nightingale that these bank-bills were formerly his, and then acquainted him with the whole affair. As there are no men who complain more of the frauds of business than highwaymen, gamesters, and other thieves of that kind, so there are none who so bitterly exclaim against the frauds of gamesters, etc., as usurers, brokers, and other thieves of this kind, 
whether it be that the one way of cheating is a discountenance or reflection upon the other, or that money, which is the common mistress of all cheats, makes them regard each other in the light of rivals. But Nightingale no sooner heard the story than he exclaimed against the fellow in terms much severer than the justice and honesty of Allworthy had bestowed on him. Allworthy desired Nightingale to retain both the money and the secret till he should hear farther from him, and if he should in the meantime see the fellow, that he would not take the least notice to him of the discovery which he had made. He then returned to his lodgings, where he found Mrs. Miller in a very dejected condition, on account of the information she had received from her son-in-law. Mr. Allworthy, with great cheerfulness, told her that he had much good news to communicate, and, with little further preface, acquainted her that he had brought Mr. Nightingale to consent to see his son, and did not in the least doubt to effect a perfect reconciliation between them, though he found the father more soured by another accident of the same kind which had happened in his family. He then mentioned the running away of the uncle's daughter, which he had been told by the old gentleman, and which Mrs. Miller and her son-in-law did not yet know. The reader may suppose Mrs. Miller received this account with great thankfulness, and no less pleasure, but so uncommon was her friendship to Jones, that I am not certain whether the uneasiness she suffered for his sake did not overbalance her satisfaction at hearing a piece of news tending so much to the happiness of her own family, nor whether even this very news, as it reminded her of the obligations she had to Jones, did not hurt as well as please her. When her grateful heart said to her, while my own family is happy, how miserable is the poor creature to whose generosity we owe the beginning of all this happiness! Allworthy, having left her a little while to chew the cut, if I may use that expression, on these first tidings, told her he had still something more to impart, which he believed would give her pleasure. I think, said he, I have discovered a pretty considerable treasure belonging to the young gentleman, your friend, but perhaps, indeed, his present situation may be such that it will be of no service to him. The latter part of the speech gave Mrs. Miller to understand who was meant, and she answered with a sigh, "'I hope not, sir.' "'I hope so, too,' cries Allworthy, "'with all my heart. But my nephew told me this morning he had heard a very bad account of the affair.' "'Good heaven, sir,' said she, well, I must not speak, and yet it is certainly very hard to be obliged to hold one's tongue when one hears. Madam, said Allworthy, you may say whatever you please, you know me too well to think I have a prejudice against any one, and as for that young man, I assure you I should be heartily pleased to find he could acquit himself of everything, and particularly of this sad affair. You can testify the affection I have formerly borne him. The world, I know, censured me for loving him so much. I did not withdraw that affection from him without thinking I had the justest cause. Believe me, Mrs. Miller, I should be glad to find I have been mistaken. Mrs. Miller was going eagerly to reply, when a servant acquainted her that a gentleman without desired to speak with her immediately. Allworthy then inquired for his nephew, and was told that he had been for some time in his room with the gentleman who used to come to him and whom Mr. Allworthy, guessing rightly to be Mr. Dowling, he desired presently to speak with him. When Dowling attended, Allworthy put the case of the banknotes to him, without mentioning any name, and asked in what manner such a person might be punished. To which Dowling answered, He thought he might be indicted on the Black Act, but said, as it was a matter of some nicety, it would be proper to go to counsel. He said he was to attend counsel presently upon an affair of Mr. Weston's, and if Mr. Allworthy pleased, he would lay the case before them. This was agreed to, and then Mrs. Miller, opening the door, cried, "'I ask pardon! I did not know you had company!' But Allworthy desired her to come in, saying he had finished his business. Upon which Mr. Dowling withdrew, and Mrs. Miller introduced Mr. Nightingale the Younger, to return thanks for the great kindness done him by Allworthy. But she had scarce patience to let the young gentleman finish his speech before she interrupted him, saying, "'Oh, sir, Mr. Nightingale brings great news about poor Mr. Jones. He hath been to see the wounded gentleman, who is out of all danger of death, and, what is more, declares he fell upon poor Mr. Jones himself, and beat him. I am sure, sir, you would not have Mr. Jones be a coward. If I was a man myself, I am sure, if any man was to strike me, I should draw my sword. Do, pray, my dear, tell Mr. Allworthy, tell him all yourself.' 
Nightingale then confirmed what Mrs. Miller had said, and concluded with many handsome things of Jones, who was, he said, one of the best-natured fellows in the world, and not in the least inclined to be quarrelsome. Here Nightingale was going to seize, when Mrs. Miller again begged him to relate all the many dutiful expressions he had heard him make use of towards Mr. Allworthy. "'To say the utmost good of Mr. Allworthy,' cries Nightingale, "'is doing no more than strict justice, and can have no merit in it. But indeed, I must say, no man can be more sensible of the obligations he hath to so good a man than his poor Jones.' Indeed, sir, I am convinced the weight of your displeasure is the heaviest burthen he lies under. He hath often lamented it to me, and hath as often protested in the most solemn manner he hath never been intentionally guilty of any offence towards you. Nay, he hath sworn he would rather die a thousand deaths than he would have his conscience upbraid him with one disrespectful, ungrateful, or undutiful thought towards you. But I ask pardon, sir. I am afraid I presume to intermeddle too far in so tender a point. "'You have spoke no more than what a Christian ought,' cries Mrs. Miller. "'Indeed, Mr. Nightingale,' answered Allworthy, "'I applaud your generous friendship, and I wish he may merit it of you. I confess I am glad to hear the report you bring from this unfortunate gentleman, and if that matter should turn out to be as you represent it, and indeed I doubt nothing of what you say, I may perhaps in time be brought to think better than lately I have of this young man. For this good gentlewoman here, nay, all who know me, can witness that I loved him as dearly as if he had been my own son. Indeed, I have considered him as a child sent by fortune to my care. I still remember the innocent, the helpless situation in which I found him. I feel the tender pressure of his little hands at this moment. He was my darling, indeed he was. At which words he ceased and the tears stood in his eyes. As the answer which Mrs. Miller made may lead us into fresh matters, we will here stop to account for the visible alteration in Mr. Allworthy's mind, and the abatement of his anger to Jones. Revolutions of this kind, it is true, do frequently occur in histories and dramatic writers, for no other reason than because the history or play draws to a conclusion, and are justified by authority of authors. Yet, though we insist upon as much authority as any author would ever, we shall use this power very sparingly, and never but when we are driven to it by necessity, which we do not at present foresee will happen in this work. This alteration, then, in the mind of Mr. Allworthy, was occasioned by a letter he had just received from Mrs. Square, and which we shall give the reader in the beginning of the next chapter. End of section 62《セクション63 of Tom Jones》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon.《Tom Jones》by Henry Fielding. Book 18, Chapter 4. Containing two letters in very different styles. My worthy friend, I informed you in my last that I was forbidden the use of the waters, as they were found by experience rather to increase than lessen the symptoms of my distemper. I must now acquaint you with a piece of news which, I believe, will afflict my friends more than it hath afflicted me. Dr. Harrington and Dr. Brewster have informed me that there is no hopes of my recovery. I have somewhere read that the great use of philosophy is to learn to die." I will not, therefore, so far disgrace mine as to show any surprise at receiving a lesson which I must be thought to have so long studied. Yet, to say the truth, one page of the Gospel teaches this lesson better than all the volumes of ancient or modern philosophers. The assurance it gives us of another life is a much stronger support to a good mind than all the consolations that are drawn from the necessity of nature, the emptiness or satiety of our enjoyments here or any other topic of those declamations which are sometimes capable of arming our minds with a stubborn patience in bearing the thoughts of death, but never of raising them to a real contempt of it, and much less of making us think it is a real good. I would not here be understood to throw the horrid censure of atheism, or even the absolute denial of immortality, on all who are called philosophers. Many of that sect, as well ancient as modern, have, from the light of reason, discovered some hopes of a future state. 
but in reality that light was so faint and glimmering, and the hopes were so incertain and precarious, that it may be justly doubted on which side their belief turned. Plato himself concludes his phalen with declaring that his best arguments amount only to raise a probability, and Cicero himself seems rather to profess an inclination to believe than any actual belief in the doctrines of immortality. As to myself, to be very sincere with you, I never was much in earnest in this faith till I was in earnest a Christian. You will perhaps wonder at the latter expression, but I assure you it hath not been till very lately that I could, with truth, call myself so. The pride of philosophy had intoxicated my reason, and the sublimest of all wisdom appeared to me, as it did to the Greeks of old, to be foolishness. God hath, however, been so gracious to show me my error in time, and to bring me into the way of truth, before I sunk into utter darkness for ever. I find myself beginning to grow weak. I shall therefore hasten to the main purpose of this letter. When I reflect on the actions of my past life, I know of nothing which sits heavier upon my conscience than the injustice I have been guilty of to that poor wretch, your adopted son. I have, indeed, not only connived at the villainy of others, but been myself active in injustice towards him. Believe me, my dear friend, when I tell you, on the word of a dying man, he hath been basely injured. As to the principal fact, upon the misrepresentation of which you discarded him, I solemnly assure you he is innocent. When you lay upon your supposed deathbed, he was the only person in the house who testified any real concern, and what happened afterwards arose from the wildness of his joy on your recovery, and, I am sorry to say it, from the baseness of another person. But it is my desire to justify the innocent, and to accuse none. Believe me, my friend, this young man had the noblest generosity of heart, the most perfect capacity for friendship, the highest integrity, and, indeed, every virtue which can ennoble a man. He hath some faults, but among them is not to be numbered the least want of duty or gratitude towards you. On the contrary, I am satisfied when you dismissed him from your house, his heart bled for you more than for himself. Worldly motives were the wicked and base reasons of my concealing this from you so long. To reveal it now I can have no inducement but the desire of serving the cause of truth, of doing right to the innocent, and of making all the amends in my power for a past offence. I hope this declaration, therefore, will have the effect desired, and will restore this deserving young man to your favour, the hearing of which, while I am yet alive, will afford the utmost consolation to, sir, your most obliged, obedient, humble servant, Thomas Square. The reader will, after this, scarce wonder at the revolution so visibly appearing in Mr. Allworthy, notwithstanding he received from Thwackham by the same post, Another letter of a very different kind, which we shall here add, as it may possibly be the last time we shall have occasion to mention the name of that gentleman. Sir, I am not at all surprised at hearing from your worthy nephew a fresh instance of the villainy of Mrs. Square the Atheist's young pupil. I shall not wonder at any murders he may commit, and I heartily pray that your own blood may not seal up his final commitment to the place of wailing and gnashing of teeth. Though you cannot want sufficient calls to repentance for the many unwarrantable weaknesses exemplified in your behaviour to this wretch, so much to the prejudice of your own lawful family and of your character, I say, though these may sufficiently be supposed to prick and goad your conscience at this season, I should yet be wanting to my duty if I spared to give you some admonition in order to bring you to a due sense of your errors. I therefore pray you seriously to consider the judgment which is likely to overtake this wicked villain, and let it serve at least as a warning to you, that you may not for the future despise the advice of one who is so indefatigable in his prayers for your welfare. Had not my hand been withheld from due correction, I had scorched much of this diabolical spirit out of a boy of whom from his infancy I discovered the devil had taken such entire possession. But reflections of this kind now come too late. I am sorry you have given away the living of Westerton so hastily. I should have applied on that occasion earlier had I thought you would not have acquainted me previous to the disposition. Your objection to pluralities is being righteous overmuch. If there were any crime in the practice, so many godly men would not agree to it. 
If the vicar of Aldergrove should die, as we hear he is in a declining way, I hope he will think of me, since I am certain you must be convinced of my most sincere attachment to your highest welfare, a welfare to which all worldly considerations are as trifling as the small tides mentioned in Scripture are, when compared to the weighty matters of the law. I am, sir, your faithful, humble servant, Roger Thwackham. This was the first time Thwackham ever wrote in this authoritative style to Allworthy, and of this he had afterwards sufficient reason to repent, as in the case of those who mistake the highest degree of goodness for the lowest degree of weakness. Allworthy had indeed never liked this man. He knew him to be proud and ill-natured. He also knew that his divinity itself was tinctured with his temper, and such as in many respects he himself did by no means approve. But he was at the same time an excellent scholar, and most indefatigable in teaching the two lads. Add to this the strict severity of his life and manners, an unimpeached honesty, and the most devout attachment to religion, so that, upon the whole, though Allworthy did not esteem nor love the man, yet he could never bring himself to part with the tutor to the boys who was, both by learning and industry, extremely well qualified for his office, and he hoped that as they were bred up in his own house, and under his own eye, he should be able to correct whatever was wrong in Thwackham's instructions. CHAPTER V. IN WHICH THE HISTORY IS CONTINUED Mr. Orworthy, in his last speech, had recollected some tender ideas concerning Jones, which had brought tears into the good man's eyes. This, Mrs. Miller observing, said, "'Yes, yes, sir, your goodness to this poor young man is known, notwithstanding all your care to conceal it. But there is not a single syllable of truth in what those villains said. Mr. Nightingale hath now discovered the whole matter. It seems these fellows were employed by a lord, who is a rival of poor Mr. Jones, to have pressed him on board a ship.' I assure them I don't know who they will press next. Mr. Nightingale here hath seen the officer himself, who is a very pretty gentleman, and hath told him all, and is very sorry for what he undertook, which he would never have done had he known Mr. Jones to have been a gentleman, but he was told that he was a common strolling vagabond. Allworthy stared at all this, and declared he was a stranger to every word she said. "'Yes, sir,' answered she, "'I believe you are.' It is a very different story, I believe, from what those fellows told this lawyer. "'What lawyer, madam? What is it you mean?' said Allworthy. "'Nay, nay,' said she, "'this is so like you to deny your own goodness. But Mr. Nightingale here saw him.' "'Saw whom, madam?' answered he. "'Why, your lawyer, sir,' said she, "'that you so kindly sent to inquire into the affair.' "'I am still in the dark, upon my honour," said Allworthy. "'Why, then, do you tell him, my dear sir?' cried she. "'Indeed, sir,' said Nightingale. "'I did see that very lawyer who went from you when I came into the room at an alehouse in Aldersgate, in company with two of the fellows who were employed by Lord Fellamar to press Mr. Jones, and who were by that means present at the unhappy encounter between him and Mr. Fitzpatrick.' "'I own, sir,' said Mrs. Miller, when I saw this gentleman come into the room to you, I told Mr. Nightingale that I apprehended you had sent him thither to inquire into the affair. Allworthy showed marks of astonishment in his countenance at this news, and was indeed for two or three minutes struck dumb by it. At last, addressing himself to Mr. Nightingale, he said, "'I must confess myself, sir, more surprised at what you tell me than I have ever been before at anything in my whole life. Are you certain this was the gentleman?' "'I am most certain,' answered Nightingale. "'At Aldersgate?' cries Orthy. "'And was you in company with this lawyer and the two fellows?' "'I was, sir,' said the other, "'very near half an hour.' "'Well, sir,' said Orthy, "'and in what manner did the lawyer behave? "'Did you hear all that passed between him and the fellows?' "'No, sir,' answered Nightingale. "'They had been together before I came. "'In my presence the lawyer said little.' But, after I had several times examined the fellows, who persisted in a story directly contrary to what I had heard from Mr. Jones, and which I find by Mr. Fitzpatrick was a rank falsehood, the lawyer then desired the fellows to say nothing but what was the truth, and seemed to speak so much in favour of Mr. Jones, that, when I saw the same person with you, I concluded your goodness had prompted you to send him thither. "'And did you not send him thither?' says Mrs. Miller. "'Indeed I did not,' answered Allworthy nor did I know he'd gone on such an errand till this moment. 
"'I see it all,' said Mrs. Miller. "'Upon my soul I see it all. "'No wonder they have been closeted so close lately. "'Son Nightingale, let me beg you run for these fellows immediately. "'Find them out if they are above ground. "'I will go myself.' "'Dear madam,' said Allworthy, "'be patient, and do me the favour to send a servant upstairs "'to call Mr. Dowling hither, if he be in the house, "'or, if not, Mr. Bliffle.' Mrs. Miller went out, muttering something to herself, and presently returned with an answer. That Mr. Dowling was gone, but that the daughter, as she called him, was coming. Allworthy was of a cooler disposition than the good woman, whose spirits were all up in arms in the cause of her friend. He was not, however, without some suspicions which were near akin to hers. When Bliffle came into the room, he asked him, with a very serious countenance, and with a less friendly look than he had ever before given him, whether he knew anything of Mr. Dowling's having seen any of the persons who were present at the duel between Jones and another gentleman. There is nothing so dangerous as a question which comes by surprise on a man whose business it is to conceal truth or to defend falsehood, for which reason those worthy personages whose noble office it is to save the lives of their fellow-creatures at the old bailey take the utmost care by frequent previous examination, to divine every question which may be asked their clients on the day of trial, that they may be supplied with proper and ready answers, which the most fertile invention cannot supply in an instant. Besides, the sudden and violent impulse on the blood, occasioned by these surprises, causes frequently such an alteration in the countenance, that the man is obliged to give evidence against himself. And such, indeed, were the alterations which the countenance of Bliffel underwent from this sudden question, that we can scarce blame the eagerness of Mrs. Miller, who immediately cried out, "'Guilty, upon my honour! Guilty, upon my soul!' Mr. Allworthy sharply rebuked her for this impetuosity, and then, turning to Bliffel, who seemed sinking into the earth, he said, "'Why do you hesitate, sir, at giving me an answer? You certainly must have employed him, for he would not, of his own accord, I believe, have undertaken such an errand, and especially without acquainting me.' Bliffle then answered, "'I own, sir, I have been guilty of an offence, yet may I hope your pardon.' "'My pardon?' said Allworthy, very angrily. "'Nay, sir,' answered Bliffle, "'I knew you would be offended, yet surely my dear uncle will forgive the effects of the most amiable of human weaknesses. Compassion for those who do not deserve it, I own, is a crime, and yet it is a crime from which you yourself are not entirely free.' I know I have been guilty of it in more than one instance to this very person, and I will own I did send Mr. Dowling, not on a vain and fruitless inquiry, but to discover the witnesses, and to endeavour to soften their evidence. This, sir, is the truth, which, though I intended to conceal from you, I will not deny. I confess, said Nightingale, this is the light in which it appeared to me from the gentleman's behaviour. Now, madam, said Allworthy. I believe you will once in your life own you have entertained a wrong suspicion, and are not so angry with my nephew as you was. Mrs. Miller was silent, for, though she could not so easily be pleased with Bliffle, whom she looked upon to have been the ruin of Jones, yet in this particular instance he had imposed upon her as well as upon the rest, so entirely had the devil stood his friend. And, indeed, I look upon the vulgar observation, that the devil often deserts his friends and leaves them in the lurch, to be a great abuse on that gentleman's character. Perhaps he may sometimes desert those who are only his cup acquaintance, or who, at most, are but half his, but he generally stands by those who are thoroughly his servants, and helps them off in all extremities till their bargain expires. As a conquered rebellion strengthens a government, or as health is more perfectly established by recovery from some diseases, so anger, when removed, often gives new life to affection. This was the case of Mr. Allworthy, for Bliffle having wiped off the greater suspicion, the lesser, which had been raised by Square's letter, sunk, of course, and was forgotten, and Thwackham, with whom he was greatly offended, bore alone all the reflections which Square had cast on the enemies of Jones. As for that young man, the resentment of Mr. Allworthy began more and more to abate towards him. He told Bliffle, he did not only forgive the extraordinary efforts of his good nature, but would give him the pleasure of following his example. Then, 
Turning to Mrs. Miller, with a smile which would have become an angel, he cried, "'What say you, madam? Shall we take a hackney coach, and all of us together pay a visit to your friend? I promise you it is not the first visit I have made in a prison.' Every reader, I believe, will be able to answer for the worthy woman. But they must have a great deal of good nature, and be well acquainted with friendship, who can feel what she felt on this occasion. Few, I hope, are capable of feeling what now passed in the mind of Bliffle, but those who are will acknowledge that it was impossible for him to raise any objection to this visit. Fortune, however, or the gentleman lately mentioned above, stood his friend, and prevented his undergoing so great a shock for at the very instant when the coach was sent for partridge arrived and having called mrs miller from the company acquainted her with a dreadful accident lately come to light and hearing mr allworthy's intention begged her to find some means of stopping him for says he the matter must at all hazards be kept a secret from him and if he should now go he will find mr jones and his mother who arrived just as i left him lamenting over one another the horrid crime they have ignorantly committed the poor woman, who was almost deprived of her senses at his dreadful news, was never less capable of invention than at present. However, as women are much readier at this than men, she bethought herself of an excuse, and, returning to Orley, said, "'I am sure, sir, you will be surprised at hearing any objection from me to the kind proposal you just now made, and yet I am afraid of the consequence of it if carried immediately into execution.' You must imagine, sir, that all the calamities which have lately befallen this poor young fellow must have thrown him into the lowest dejection of spirits. And now, sir, should we all on a sudden fling him into such a violent fit of joy as I know your presence will occasion, it may, I am afraid, produce some fatal mischief, especially as his servant, who is without, tells me he is very far from being well. "'Is a servant without?' cries Orthy. "'Pray call him hither.' I will ask him some questions concerning his master. Partridge was at first afraid to appear before Mr. Allworthy, but was at length persuaded, after Mrs. Miller, who had often heard his whole story from his own mouth, had promised to introduce him. Allworthy recollected Partridge the moment he came into the room, though many years had passed since he had seen him. Mrs. Miller, therefore, might have spared her a formal oration, in which, indeed, she was something prolix for the reader, I believe, may have observed already that the good woman, among other things, had a tongue always ready for the service of her friends. "'And are you,' said Allworthy to Partridge, "'the servant of Mr. Jones?' "'I can't say, sir,' answered he, "'that I am regularly a servant, but I live with him, and please your honour, at present. Non sum qualis iram, as your honour very well knows.' Mr. Allworthy then asked him many questions concerning Jones, as to his health and other matters, to all which Partridge answered, without having the least regard to what was, but considered only what he would have things appear, for a strict adherence to truth was not among the articles of this honest fellow's morality or his religion. During this dialogue Mr. Nightingale took his leave, and presently after Mrs. Miller left the room, when Allworthy likewise dispatched Bliffle, for he imagined that Partridge, when alone with him, would be more explicit than before company. They were no sooner left in private together than Allworthy began, as in the following chapter. Chapter 6. In which the history is farther continued. Sure, friend, said the good man, you are the strangest of all human beings, not only to have suffered as you have formerly for obstinately persisting in a falsehood, but to persist in it thus to the last and to pass thus upon the world for a servant of your own son. What interest can you have in all this? What can be your motive? I see, sir, said Partridge, falling down upon his knees, that your honour is prepossessed against me, and resolve not to believe anything I say, and therefore what signifies my protestations. But yet there is one above who knows that I am not the father of this young man. How? said Allworthy. Will you yet deny what you was formerly convicted of upon such unanswerable, such manifest evidence? Nay, what a confirmation is your being now found with this very man, of all which twenty years ago appeared against you? I thought you had left the country. Nay, I thought you had been long since dead. In what manner did you know anything of this young man? Where did you meet with him, unless you had kept some correspondence together? Do not deny this for I promise you it will greatly raise your son in my opinion 
to find that he had such a sense of filial duty as privately to support his father for so many years. "'If your honour will have patience to hear me,' said Partridge, "'I will tell you all.' Being bid go on, he proceeded thus. "'When your honour conceived that displeasure against me, it ended in my ruin soon after, for I lost my little school, and the minister, thinking, I suppose, it would be agreeable to your honour, turned me out from the office of clerk.' so that I had nothing to trust to but the barber's shop, which, in a country place like that, is a poor livelihood, and when my wife died, for till that time I received a pension of twelve pounds a year from an unknown hand, which indeed I believe was your honour's own, for nobody that ever I heard of doth these things besides. But, as I was saying, when she died, this pension forsook me, so that now, as I owed two or three small debts, which began to be troublesome to me, particularly one— which an attorney brought up by law charges from fifteen shillings to nearly thirty pounds, and as I found all my usual means of living had forsook me, I packed up my little all as well as I could, and went off. Footnote. This is a fact which I knew happened to a poor clergyman in Dorsetshire by the villainy of an attorney who, not contented with the exorbitant costs to which the poor man was put by a single action, brought afterwards another action on the judgment, as it was called, a method frequently used to oppress the poor and bring money into the pockets of attorneys, to the great scandal of the law, of the nation, of Christianity, and even of the human nature itself. And footnote. The first place I came to was Salisbury, where I got into the service of a gentleman belonging to the law, and one of the best gentlemen that ever I knew, for he was not only good to me, but I knew a thousand good and charitable acts which he did while I stayed with him and I have known him often refuse business because it was paltry and oppressive. "'You need not be so particular,' said Allworthy. "'I know this gentleman, and a very worthy man he is, and an honour to his profession.' "'Well, sir,' continued Partridge, "'from hence I removed to Lymington, where I was above three years in the service of another lawyer, who was likewise a very good sort of a man, and to be sure one of the merriest gentlemen in England.' Well, sir, at the end of the three years I set up a little school, and was likely to do well again, had it not been for a most unlucky accident. Here I kept a pig, and one day, as ill fortune would have it, this pig broke out, and did a trespass, I think they call it, in a garden belonging to one of my neighbours, who was a proud, revengeful man, and employed a lawyer, one, one, I can't think of his name, but he sent for a writ against me, and had me to size. When I came there, Lord have mercy upon me, to hear what the counsellors said. There was one that told my lord a parcel of the confoundedest lies about me. He said that I used to drive my hogs into other folks' gardens, and a great deal more, and at last, he said, he hoped I had at last brought my hogs to a fair market. To be sure, one would have thought that, instead of being owner only of one poor little pig, I had been the greatest hog merchant in England. Well, pray, said Allworthy. Do not be so particular. I have heard nothing of your son yet. Oh, it was a great many years, answered Partridge, before I saw my son, as you are pleased to call him. I went over to Ireland after this, and taught school at Cork, for that one suit ruined me again, and I lay seven years in Winchester jail. Well, said Worthy, pass that over till your return to England. Then, sir, said he, it was about half a year ago that I landed at Bristol, where I stayed some time, and not finding it due there, and hearing of a place between that and Gloucester, where the barber was just dead, I went thither, and there I had been about two months when Mr. Jones came thither. He then gave Allworthy a very particular account of their first meeting, and of everything, as well as he could remember, which had happened from that day to this, frequently interlarding his story with panegyrics on Jones, and not forgetting to insinuate the great love and respect which he had for Allworthy. He concluded with saying, now, sir, I have told your honour the whole truth, and then repeated a most solemn protestation, that he was no more the father of Jones than of the Pope of Rome, and imprecated the most bitter curses on his head if he did not speak truth. "'What am I to think of this matter?' cries Allworthy. "'For what purpose should you so strongly deny a fact which I think it would be rather your interest to own?' "'Nay, sir,' answered Partridge, for he could hold no longer. If your honour will not believe me, you are like soon to have satisfaction enough. I wish you had mistaken the mother of this young man as well as you have his father. 
and now being asked what he meant, with all the symptoms of horror, both in his voice and countenance, he told Orworthy the whole story, which he had a little before expressed such desire to Mrs. Miller to conceal from him. Allworthy was almost as much shocked at this discovery as Partridge himself had been while he related it. "'Good heavens!' says he. "'In what miserable distresses do vice and imprudence involve men! How much beyond our designs are the effects of wickedness sometimes carried!' He had scarce uttered these words when Mrs. Waters came hastily and abruptly into the room. Partridge no sooner saw her than he cried, "'Here, sir, here is the very woman herself. This is the unfortunate mother of Mrs. Jones. I am sure she will acquit me before your honour. Pray, madam.' Mrs. Waters, without paying any regard to what Partridge said, and almost without taking any notice of him, advanced to Mr. Allworthy. "'I believe, sir, it is so long since I had the honour of seeing you that you do not recollect me.' "'Indeed,' answered Allworthy. "'You are so very much altered, on many accounts, that had not this man already acquainted me who you are, I should not have immediately called you to my remembrance. Have you, madam, any particular business which brings you to me?' Allworthy spoke this with great reserve, for the reader may easily believe he was not well pleased with the conduct of this lady, neither with what he had formerly heard, nor with what Partridge had now delivered. Mrs. Waters answered, "'Indeed, sir, I have very particular business with you, and it is such as I can impart only to yourself. I must desire, therefore, the favour of a word with you alone, for I assure you what I have to tell you is of the utmost importance.' Partridge was then ordered to withdraw but before he went he begged the lady to satisfy Mr. Orworthy that he was perfectly innocent, to which she answered, "'You need be under no apprehension, sir. I shall satisfy Mr. Orworthy very perfectly of that matter.' Then Partridge withdrew, and that passed between Mr. Orworthy and Mrs. Waters, which is written in the next chapter. End of section 63《Section 64 of Tom Jones》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Stearns《Tom Jones》by Henry Fielding Book 18, Chapter 7-9 through 9. Chapter 7 Continuation of the History Mrs. Waters remaining a few moments silent, Mr. Allworthy could not refrain from saying, I am sorry, madam, to perceive, by what I have since heard, that you have made so very ill a use. Mr. Allworthy, says she, interrupting him, I know I have faults, but ingratitude to you is not one of them. I never can nor shall forget your goodness, which I own I have very little deserved, but be pleased to waive all upbraiding me at present, as I have so important an affair to communicate to you concerning this young man to whom you have given my maiden name of Jones. Have I then, said Allworthy, ignorantly punished an innocent man in the person of him who hath just left us? Was he not the father of the child? Indeed he was not, said Mrs. Waters. You may be pleased to remember, sir, I formerly told you you should one day know, and I acknowledge myself to have been guilty of a cruel neglect in not having discovered it to you before. Indeed, I little knew how necessary it was. Well, madam, said Allworthy, be pleased to proceed. You must remember, sir, said she, a young fellow whose name was Summer, "'Very well,' cries Allworthy. "'He was the son of a clergyman of great learning and virtue, "'for whom I had the greatest friendship.' "'So it appeared, sir,' answered she, "'for I believe you bred the young man up, "'and maintained him at the university, "'where, I think, he has finished his studies, "'when he came to reside at your house. "'A finer man, I must say, the son never shone upon, "'for, besides the handsomest person I ever saw, "'he was so genteel, 
and had so much wit and good breeding. Poor gentleman, said Alworthy, he was indeed untimely snatched away, and little did I think he had any sins of this kind to answer for, for I plainly perceive you are going to tell me he was the father of your child. Indeed, sir, answered she, he was not. How? said Alworthy. To what then tends all this preface? To a story, said she, which I am concerned falls to my lot to unfold to you. Oh, sir, prepare to hear something which will grieve you. Speak, said Alworthy. I am conscious of no crime, and cannot be afraid to hear. Sir, said she, that Mr. Summer, the son of your friend, educated at your expense, who, after living a year in the house as if he had been your own son, died there of the smallpox, was tenderly lamented by you, and buried as if he had been your own. That Sumner, sir, was the father of this child. How, said Allworthy, you contradict yourself. That I do not, answered she. He was indeed the father of this child, but not by me. Take care, madam, said Allworthy. Do not, to shun the imputation of any crime, be guilty of falsehood. Remember, there is one from whom you can conceal nothing, and before whose tribunal falsehood will only aggravate your guilt. Indeed, sir, says she, I am not his mother, nor would I now think myself so for the world. I know your reason, said Allworthy, and shall rejoice as much as you to find it otherwise. Yet you must remember, you yourself confessed it before me. So far what I confessed, said she, was true, that these hands conveyed the infant to your bed, conveyed it thither at the command of its mother, at her commands, I afterwards owned it, and thought myself, by her generosity, nobly rewarded, both for my secrecy and my shame. Who could this woman be? said Allworthy. Indeed, I tremble to name her, answered Mrs. Waters. By all this preparation, I am to guess that she was a relation of mine, cried he. Indeed, she was a near one. At which words? Already started, and she continued. You had a sister, sir. A sister? repeated he, looking aghast. As there is truth in heaven, cries she, your sister was the mother of that child you found between your sheets. Can it be possible? cries he. Good heavens! Have patience, sir, said Mrs. Waters, and I will unfold to you the whole story. Just after your departure from London, Miss Bridget came one day to the house of my mother. She was pleased to say she had heard an extraordinary character of me, for my learning and superior understanding to all the young women there. So she was pleased to say. She then bid me come to her to the great house, where, when I attended, she employed me to read to her. She expressed great satisfaction in my reading, shewed great kindness to me, and made me many presents. At last she began to catechize me on the subject of secrecy, to which I gave her such satisfactory answers that, at last, having locked the door of her room, she took me into her closet, and then locking the door likewise, she said she should convince me of the vast reliance she had on my integrity, by communicating a secret in which her honour, and consequently her life, was concerned. She then stopped, and after a silence of a few minutes, during which she often wiped her eyes, she inquired of me, thought my mother might safely be confided in. I answered, I would stake my life on her fidelity. She then imparted to me the great secret which laboured in her breast, in which I believe was delivered with more pains than she afterwards suffered in childbirth. It was then contrived that my mother and myself only should attend at the time, and that Mrs. Wilkins should be sent out of the way as she accordingly was, to the very furthest part of Dorsetshire, to inquire the character of a servant, for the lady had turned away her own maid near three months before, during all which time I officiated about her person upon trial, as she said, though, as she afterwards declared, I was not sufficiently handy for the place. This, and many other such things which she used to say of me, were all thrown out to prevent any suspicion which Wilkins might hereafter have. 
when I was to own the child, for she thought it could never be believed she would venture to hurt a young woman with whom she had entrusted such a secret. You may be assured, sir, I was well paid for all these affronts, which together with being informed of the occasion of them very well contented me. Indeed, the lady had greater suspicion of Mrs. Wilkins than of any other person. Not that she had the least aversion to the gentlewoman, but she thought her incapable of keeping a secret, especially from you, sir, for I have often heard Miss Bridget say that if Mrs. Wilkins had committed a murder, she believed she would acquaint you with it. At last the expected day came, and Mrs. Wilkins, who had been kept a week in readiness, and put off from time to time, upon some pretense or other, that she might not return too soon, was dispatched. Then the child was born, in the presence only of myself and my mother, and was by my mother conveyed to her own house, where it was privately kept by her till the evening of your return, when I, by the command of Miss Bridget, conveyed it into the bed where you found it, and all suspicions were afterwards laid asleep by the artful conduct of your sister, in pretending ill will to the boy, and that any regard she shewed him was out of mere complacence to you. Mrs. Waters then made many protestations of the truth of this story, and concluded by saying, Thus, sir, you have at last discovered your nephew, for so I am sure you will hereafter think him, and I question not but he will be both an honour and a comfort to you under that appellation. I need not, madam, said Allworthy, express my astonishment at what you have told me, and yet surely you would not, and could not, have put together so many circumstances to evidence an untruth. I confess I recollect some passages relating to that summer, which formerly gave me a conceit that my sister had some liking to him. I mentioned it to her, for I had such a regard to the young man, as well on his own account as on his father's, that I should willingly have consented to a match between them. But she expressed the highest disdain of my unkind suspicion, as she called it, so that I never spoke more on the subject. Good heavens! Well, the Lord disposeth all things. Yet sure it was a most unjustifiable conduct in my sister to carry the secret with her out of the world. I promise you, sir, said Mrs. Waters, she always professed a contrary intention, and frequently told me she intended one day to communicate it to you. She said, indeed, she was highly rejoiced that her plot had succeeded so well, and that you had, of your own accord, taken such a fancy to the child, that it was yet unnecessary to make any express declaration. Oh, sir, had that lady lived to have seen this poor young man turn like a vagabond from your house? Nay, sir, could she have lived to hear that you had yourself employed a lawyer to prosecute him for a murder of which he was not guilty? Forgive me, Mr. Allworthy, I must say it was unkind. Indeed, you have been abused. He never deserved it of you. Indeed, madam, said Allworthy, I have been abused by the person, whoever he was, that told you so. Nay, sir, said she, I would not be mistaken. I did not presume to say you were guilty of any wrong. The gentleman who came to me proposed no such matter. He only said, taking me for Mr. Fitzpatrick's wife, that if Mr. Jones had murdered my husband, I should be assisted with any money I wanted to carry on the prosecution by a very worthy gentleman, who, he said, was well apprised what a villain I had to deal with. It was by this man I found out who Mr. Jones was, and this man, whose name was Dowling, Mr. Jones tells me, is your steward. I discovered his name by a very odd accident, for he himself refused to tell it me, but Partridge, who met him at my lodgings the second time he came, knew him formerly at Salisbury. And did this Mr. Dowling, said Allworthy, with great astonishment in his countenance, tell you that I would assist in the prosecution? No, sir, answered she, I will not charge him wrongfully. He said I should be assisted, but he mentioned no name. Yet you must pardon me, sir, if from circumstances I thought it could be no other. Indeed, madam, said Allworthy, from circumstances I am too well convinced it was another. Good heaven, by what wonderful means is the blackest and deepest villainy sometimes discovered? Shall I beg you, madam, to stay till the person you have mentioned comes? For I expect him every minute. Nay, 
He may be, perhaps, already in the house. Allworthy then stepped to the door, in order to call a servant, when in came, not Mr. Dowling, but the gentleman who will be seen in the next chapter. Chapter 8. Further Continuation The gentleman who now arrived was no other than Mr. Western. He no sooner saw Allworthy than, without considering in the least the presence of Mrs. Waters, he began to vociferate in the following manner. Fine doings at my house! A rare kettle of fish I have discovered at last. Who the devil would be plagued with a daughter? What's the matter, neighbor? said Allworthy. Matter enough, answered Western, when I thought she was just a-coming too. Nay, when she had in a manner promised me to do as I would ha her, and when I was a-hoped to have had nothing more to do than to have sent for the lawyer and finished all. What do you think I have found out? That the little bee hath been playing tricks with me all the while, and carrying on a correspondence with that bastard of yours. Sister Western, whom I have quarrelled with upon her account, sent me word of it, and I ordered her pockets to be searched when she was asleep, and here I have got em, signed with the son of a whore's own name. I have not had patience to read half of it, for tis longer than one of Parson Supple's sermons, but I find plainly it is all about love, and indeed what should it be else? I have packed her up in chamber again, and to-morrow morning down she goes into the country, unless she consents to be married directly, and there she shall live in a garret upon bread and water all her days, and the sooner such a bee breaks her heart the better. Though, D. blank and her, that I believe is too young. She will live long enough to plague me. Mr. Western, answered Allworthy, you know, I have always protested against force, and you yourself consented that none should be used. I, cries he, that was only upon condition that she would consent without. What the devil and Dr. Faustus? Shan't I do what I will with my own daughter, especially when I desire nothing but her own good? Well, neighbor, answered Allworthy, if you will give me leave, I will undertake once to argue with the young lady. Will you? said Western. Why, that is kind now, and neighborly, and mayhap you will do more than I have been able to do with her, for I promise you she hath a very good opinion of you. Well, sir, said Allworthy, if you will go home and release the young lady from her captivity, I will wait upon her within this half hour. But suppose, said Western, she should run away with un in the meantime, for lawyer Dowling tells me there is no hopes of hanging a fellow at last, for that the man is alive and like to do well, and that he thinks Jones will be out of prison again presently. How, said Allworthy, what, did you employ him then to inquire, or to do anything in that matter? Not I, answered Western. He mentioned it to me just now of his own accord. Just now, cries Allworthy, why, where did you see him then? I want much to see Mr. Dowling. Why, you may see him, and you will presently at my lodgings for there is to be a meeting of lawyers there this morning, about a mortgage. I cod, I shall lose two or three thousand pounds, I believe, by that honest gentleman, Mr. Nightingale. Well, sir, said Allworthy, I will be with you within the half hour. And do for once, cries the squire, take a fool's advice. Never think of dealing with her by gentle methods. Take my word for it, those will never do. I have tried em long enough. She must be frightened into it. There is no other way. Tell her I'm her father, and of the horrid sin of disobedience, and of the dreadful punishment of it, in t'other world. And then tell her about being locked up all her life in a garret in this, and being kept only on bread and water. I will do all I can, said Allworthy, for I promise you there is nothing I wish for more than an alliance with this amiable creature. Nay, the girl is well enough for matter of that, cries the squire. A man may go farther, and meet with worse meat. That I may declare of her. Though if she be my own daughter, and if she will, but be obedient to me, there is narrow a father within a hundred miles of the place, that loves the daughter more than I do. But I see you are busy with the lady there, so I go home, and expect you, and so your humble servant. As soon as Mr. Western was gone, Mrs. Waters said, I see, sir, 
the squire hath not the least remembrance of my face. I believe, Mr. Allworthy, you would not have known me neither. I am very considerably altered since that day when you so kindly gave me that advice, which I had been happy had I followed. Indeed, madam, cries Allworthy, it gave me a great concern when I first heard the contrary. Indeed, sir, said she, I was ruined by a very deep scheme of villainy, which, if you knew, though I pretend not to think it would justify me, in your opinion, it would at least mitigate my offence, and induce you to pity me. You are not now at leisure to hear my whole story, but this I assure you, I was betrayed by the most solemn promises of marriage, nay, in the eye of heaven I was married to him. For after much reading on the subject I am convinced that particular ceremonies are only requisite to give a legal sanction of marriage, and have only a worldly use in giving a woman the privileges of a wife. But that she who lives constant to one man, after a solemn private affiance, whatever the world may call her, hath little to charge on her own conscience. I am sorry, madam, said Allworthy, you made so ill a use of your learning. Indeed, it would have been well that you had been possessed of much more, or had remained in a state of ignorance. And yet, madam, I am afraid you have more than this sin to answer for. During his life, answered she, which was above a dozen years, I most solemnly assured you I had not. And consider, sir, on my behalf, what is in the power of a woman, stripped of a reputation, and left destitute? Whether the good-natured world will suffer such a stray sheep to return to the road of virtue, even if she was never so desirous? I protest, then, I would have chose it had it been in my power, but necessity drove me into the arms of Captain Waters, with whom, though still unmarried, I lived as a wife for many years, and went by his name. I parted with this gentleman at Worcester, on his march against the rebels, and it was then I accidentally met with Mr. Jones, who rescued me from the hands of a villain. Indeed, he is the worthiest of men. No young gentleman of his age is, I believe, freer from vice, and few have the twentieth part of his virtues. Nay, whatever vices he hath had, I am firmly persuaded he hath now taken a resolution to abandon them. I hope he hath, cries Allworthy, and I hope he will preserve that resolution. I must say I have still the same hopes with regard to yourself. The world, I do agree, are apt to be too unmerciful on these occasions. Yet time and perseverance will get the better of their disinclination, as they may call it, to pity, for though they are not, like heaven, ready to receive a penitent sinner, yet a continued repentance will at length obtain mercy even with the world. This you may be assured of, Mrs. Waters, that whenever I find you are sincere in such good intentions, you shall want no assistance in my power to make them effectual. Mrs. Waters fell now upon her knees before him, and in a flood of tears made him many most passionate acknowledgments of his goodness, which, as she truly said, savoured more of the divine than human nature. Allworthy raised her up, and spoke in a most tender manner, making use of every expression which his invention could suggest to comfort her, when he was interrupted by the arrival of Mr. Dowling, who, upon his first entrance, seeing Mrs. Waters, started, and appeared in some confusion, from which he soon recovered himself as well as he could, and then said he was in the utmost haste to attend counsel in Mr. Western's lodgings, but, however, thought it was his duty to call and acquaint him with the opinion of counsel upon the case which he had before told him, which was, that conversation of the monies in that case could not be questioned in a criminal cause, and that an action of trover might be bought, and if it appeared to the jury to be monies of plaintiff, that plaintiff would recover a verdict for the value. Allworthy, without making any answer to this, bolted the door, and then, advancing with a stern look to Dowling, he said, Whatever be your haste, sir, I must first receive an answer to some questions. Do you know this lady? That lady, sir, answered Dowling, with great hesitation. Allworthy, then, with a most solemn voice, said, Look, you, Mr. Dowling, as you value my favour, or your continuance a moment longer in my service, do not hesitate nor prevaricate, but answer faithfully and truthfully to every question I ask. Do you know this lady? 
"'Yes, sir,' said Dowling. "'I have seen the lady.' "'Where, sir?' "'At her own lodgings.' "'Upon what business did you go thither, sir, and who sent you?' "'I went, sir, to inquire, sir, about Mr. Jones.' "'And who sent you to inquire about him?' "'Who, sir?' "'Why, sir, Mr. Billfill sent me.' "'And what did you say to the lady concerning that matter?' "'Nay, sir, it is impossible to recollect every word. "'Will you please, madam, to assist the gentleman's memory?' "'He told me, sir,' said Mrs. Waters, "'that if Mr. Jones had murdered my husband, "'I should be assisted by any money I wanted "'to carry on the prosecution by a very worthy gentleman.' who was well apprised what a villain I had to deal with. These, I can safely swear, were the very words he spoke. "'Were these the words, sir?' said Allworthy. "'I cannot charge my memory exactly,' cries Dowling, "'but I believe I did speak to that purpose.' "'And did Mr. Billfill order you to say so?' "'I am sure, sir, I should not have gone on my own accord, "'nor have willingly exceeded my authority in matters of this kind.' If I said so, I must have so understood Mr. Billfill's instructions. "'Look you, Mr. Dowling,' said Allworthy, "'I promised you before this lady that whatever you have done in this affair by Mr. Billfill's order I will forgive, provided you now tell me strictly the truth. For I believe what you say, that you would not have acted of your own accord and without authority in this matter. Mr. Billfill then likewise sent you to examine the two fellows at Aldersgate? He did, sir. Well, and what instructions did he then give you? Recollect as well as you can, and tell me, as near as possible, the very words he used. Why, sir, Mr. Billfill sent me to find out the persons who were eyewitnesses of this fight. He said he feared they might be tampered with by Mr. Jones, or some of his friends. He said a blood required blood, and that not only all who concealed a murderer, but those who omitted anything in their power to bring him to justice, were sharers in his guilt. He said he found you was very desirous of having the villain brought to justice, though it was not proper you should appear in it. He did so, says Allworthy. Yes, sir, cries Dowling. I should not, I am sure, have proceeded such lengths for the sake of any other person living but for your worship. What length, sir? said Allworthy. "'Nay, sir,' cries Dowling, "'I would not have your worship think I would, on any account, be guilty of subordination or of perjury. But there are two ways of delivering evidence. I told them, therefore, that if any offer should be made them on the other side, they should refuse them, and that they might be assured they should lose nothing by being honest men and telling the truth. I said we were told that Mr. Jones had assaulted the gentleman first, and that, if that was the truth, they should declare it, and I did not give them some hints that they should be no losers. I think you went lengths indeed, cries Allworthy. Nay, sir, answered Dowling. I am sure I did not desire them to tell an untruth, nor should I have said what I did unless it had been to oblige you. You would not have thought, I believe, says Allworthy, to have obliged me had you known that this Mr. Jones was my own nephew. "'I am sure, sir,' answered he, "'it did not become me to take any notice "'of what I thought you desired to conceal.' "'How?' cries Allworthy. "'And did you know it then?' "'Nay, sir,' answered Dowling, "'if your worship bids me speak the truth, "'I am sure I shall do it. "'Indeed, sir, I did know it, "'for they were almost the last words "'which Madame Billfill ever spoke, "'which she mentioned to me "'as I stood alone by her bedside, "'when she delivered me the letter "'I brought your worship from her.' "'What letter?' cries Allworthy. "'The letter, sir,' answered Dowling, "'which I brought from Salisbury, "'and which I delivered into the hands of Mr. Billfill. "'Oh, heavens!' cries Allworthy. "'Well, and what were the words? "'What did my sister say to you?' "'She took me by the hand,' answered he, "'and as she delivered me the letter, said, "'I scarce know what I have written. "'Tell my brother, Mr. Jones is his nephew. "'He is my son. Bless him,' says she, "'and then fell backward.' as if dying away. I presently called on the people, and she never spoke more to me, and died within a few minutes afterwards. Allworthy stood a minute silent, lifting up his eyes, and then turning to Dowling, said, 
How came you, sir, not to deliver me this message? Your worship, answered he, must remember that you was at the time ill in bed, and being in a violent hurry, as indeed I always am, I delivered the letter and message to Mr. Billfield, who told me that he would carry them both to you, which he hath since told me he did, and that your worship, partly out of friendship to Mr. Jones, and partly out of regard to your sister, would never have it mentioned, and did intend to conceal it from the world, and therefore, sir, if you had not mentioned it to me first, I am certain I should never have thought it belonged to me to say anything of the matter, either to your worship or any other person. We have remarked somewhere already that it is possible for a man to convey a lie in the words of truth. This was the case at present, for Billfield had, in fact, told Dowling what he now related, but had not imposed upon him, who indeed had imagined he was able so to do. In reality, the promises which Billfield had made to Dowling were the motives which had induced him to secrecy, and as he now very plainly saw Billfield could not be able to keep them, he thought proper now to make his confession, which the promises of forgiveness, joined to the threats, the voice, the looks of Allworthy, and the discoveries he had made before, extorted from him, who was besides taking unawares, and had no time to consider of evasions. Allworthy appeared well satisfied with this relation, and having enjoined on Dowling strict silence to what had passed, conducted that gentleman himself to the door, lest he should see Bilfo, who was returned to his chamber, where he exulted in the thoughts of his last deceit on his uncle, and little suspected what had since passed below stairs. As Allworthy was returning to his room, he met Mrs. Miller in the entry, who, with a face all pale and full of terror, said to him, "'Oh, sir, I find this wicked woman hath been with you, and you know all. Yet do not on this account abandon the poor young man. Consider, sir, he was ignorant and was his own mother, and the discovery itself will most probably break his heart without your unkindness.' Madam, says Allworthy, I am under such an astonishment at what I have heard that I am really unable to satisfy you. But come with me into my room. Indeed, Mrs. Miller, I have made surprising discoveries, and you shall soon know them. The poor woman followed him trembling, and now Allworthy, going up to Mrs. Waters, took her by the hand, and then returning to Mrs. Miller, said, What reward shall I bestow upon this gentlewoman for the services she hath done me? O oh, Mrs. Miller, you have a thousand times heard me call the young man, to whom you are so faithful a friend, my son. Little did I then think he was indeed related to me at all. Your friend, madam, is my nephew, for he is the brother of that wicked viper which I have so long nourished in my bosom. She will herself tell you the whole story, and how the youth came to pass for her son. Indeed, Mrs. Miller, I am convinced that he hath been wronged, and that I have been abused, abused by one whom you too justly suspected of being a villain. He is in truth the worst of villains. The joy which Mrs. Miller now felt bereft her of the power of speech, and might perhaps have deprived her of her senses, if not of life, had not a friendly shower of tears come seasonably to her relief. At length, recovering so far from her transport as to be able to speak, she cried, And is my dear Mr. Jones then your nephew, sir, and not the son of this lady, and are your eyes open to him at last? and shall I live to see him as happy as he deserves? He certainly is my nephew, said Allworthy, and I hope all the rest. And is this the dear good woman, the person, cries she, to whom all this discovery is owing? She is indeed, said Allworthy. Why then, cried Mrs. Miller upon her knees, may heaven shower down its choicest blessings upon her head, and for this one good action forgive her all her sins, be they, ne be they never so many. Mrs. Waters then informed them that she believed Jones would very shortly be released, for that the surgeon was gone, in company with the nobleman, to the justice who committed him, in order to certify that Mr. Fitzpatrick was out of all manner of danger, and to procure his prisoner his liberty. Allworthy said he should be glad to find his nephew there at his return home, but that he was then obliged to go on some business of consequence. He then called to a servant to fetch him a chair, and presently left the two ladies together. Mr. Billfield, hearing the chair ordered, came downstairs to attend upon his uncle, for he never was deficient in such acts of duty. He asked his uncle if he was going out, which is a civil way of asking a man whether he was going. To which the other making no answer, he again desired to know when he would be pleased to return. Allworthy made no answer to this neither, 
till he was just going into his chair, and then turning about he said, Harkee, sir, do you find out, before my return, the letter which your mother sent me on her deathbed? Allworthy then departed, and left Billville in a situation to be envied only by a man who was just going to be hanged. Chapter Ten, A Further Continuation Allworthy took an opportunity, whilst he was in the chair, of reading the letter from Jones to Sophia, which Western delivered him, and there were some expressions in it concerning himself, which drew tears from his eyes. At length he arrived at Mr. Western's, and was introduced to Sophia. When the first ceremonies were passed, and the gentleman and lady had taken their chairs, a silence of some minutes ensued, during which the latter, who had been prepared for the visit by her father, sat playing with her fan, and had every mark of confusion both in her countenance and behaviour. At length Allworthy, who was himself a little disconcerted, began thus. I am afraid, Miss Western, my family hath been the occasion of giving you some uneasiness, to which I fear I have innocently become more instrumental than I intended. Be assured, madam, had I at first known how disagreeable the proposals had been, I should not have suffered you to be have been so longly persecuted. I hope, therefore, you will not think the design of this visit is to trouble you with any further solicitations of that kind, but entirely to relieve you from them. Sir, said Sophia, with a little modest hesitation, this behaviour is most kind and generous, and such as I could expect only from Mr. Allworthy. But as you have been so kind as to mention this matter, you will pardon me for saying it hath, indeed, given me great uneasiness, and hath been the occasion of my suffering, much cruel treatment from a father who was, till that unhappy affair, the tenderest and fondest of all parents. I am convinced, sir, you are too good and generous to resent my refusal of your nephew. Our inclinations are not in your own power, and whatever may be his merit, I cannot force them in his favour. I assure you, most amiable young lady, said Allworthy, I am capable of no such resentment. Had the person been my own son, and had I entertained the highest esteem for him, for you say truly, madam, we cannot force our inclinations, much less can they be directed by another. Oh, sir, answered Sophia, every word you speak proves you deserve the good, that good, that great, that benevolent character that the whole world allows you. I assure you, sir, nothing less than the certain prospect of future misery could have made me resist the commands of my father. I sincerely believe you, madam, replied Allworthy, and I heartily congratulate you on your prudent foresight, since by so justifiable a resistance you have avoided misery indeed. You speak now, Mr. Allworthy, cried she, with a delicacy which few men are capable of feeling, but surely, in my opinion, to lead our lives with one to whom we are indifferent must be a state of wretchedness. Perhaps that wretchedness would be even increased by the sense of the merits of an object to whom we cannot give our attentions. If I had married Mr. Billfield, pardon my interrupting you, madam, answered Allworthy, but I cannot bear the supposition. Believe me, Miss Western, I rejoice in my heart, I rejoice in your escape. I have discovered the wretch for whom you have suffered all this cruel violence from your father to be a villain. How, sir, cries Sophia, you must believe this surprises me. It hath surprised me, madam, answered Allworthy, and so it will the world. But I have acquainted you with the real truth. Nothing but truth, says Sophia, can, I am convinced, come from the lips of Mr. Allworthy. Yet, sir, such sudden, such unexpected news, discovered, you say, may villainy be ever so. You will soon enough hear the story, cries Allworthy. At present let us not mention so detested a name. I have another matter of a very serious nature to propose. Oh, Miss Western, I know your vast worth, nor can I so easily part with the ambition of being allied to it. I have a near relation, madam, a young man whose character is, I am convinced, the very opposite to that of this wretch, and whose fortune I will make equal to what his was to have been. Could I, madam, hope you would admit a visit from him? Sophia, after a minute's silence, answered, I will deal with the utmost sincerity with Mr. Allworthy. His character and the obligation I have just received from him demand it. I have determined at present to listen to no such proposals from any person. My only desire is to be restored to the affection of my father, and to be again the mistress of his family. This, sir, I hope to owe to your good offices. Let me beseech you, let me conjure you, 
but all the goodness which I, and all who know you, have experienced, do not, the very moment when you have released me from one persecution, do not engage me in another as miserable and fruitless. Indeed, Miss Western, replied Allworthy, I am capable of no such conduct. And if this be your resolution, he must submit to the disappointment, whatever torments he may suffer under it. I must smile now, Mr. Allworthy, answered Sophia, when you mention the torments of a man whom I do not know, and who can consequently have so little acquaintance with me. Pardon me, dear young lady, cries Allworthy. I begin now to be afraid he hath had too much acquaintance for the repose of his future days, since, if ever man was capable of a sincere, violent, and noble passion, such, I am convinced, is my unhappy nephew's for Miss Western. A nephew of yours, Mr. Allworthy, answered Sophia. It is surely strange. I never heard of him before. Indeed, madam, cries Allworthy, it is only the circumstance of his being my nephew to which you are a stranger, and which, to this day, was a secret to me. Mr. Jones, who has long loved you, he, he is my nephew. Mr. Jones, your nephew, sir, cries Sophia, can it be possible? He is indeed, madam, answered Allworthy. He is my own sister's son. As such I shall always own him. Nor am I ashamed of owning him. I am much more ashamed of my past behaviour to him. But I was as ignorant of his merit as of his birth. Indeed, Miss Western, I have used him cruelly. Indeed I have. Here the good man wiped his eyes, and after a short pause proceeded. I never shall be able to reward him for his sufferings without your assistance. Believe me, most amiable young lady, I must have a great esteem of that offering which I make to your worth. I know he hath been guilty of faults, but there is great goodness of heart at the bottom. Believe me, madam, there is. Here he stopped, seeming to expect an answer, which he presently received from Sophia, after she had a little recovered herself from the hurry of spirits into which so strange and sudden information had thrown her. I sincerely wish you joy, sir, of a discovery in which you seem to have such satisfaction. I doubt not but you will have all the comfort you can promise yourself from it. The young gentleman hath certainly a thousand good qualities, which makes it impossible he should not behave well to, to such an uncle. I hope, madam, said Allworthy, he hath those good qualities which must make him a good husband. He must, I am sure, be of all men the most abandoned. If a lady of your merit should condescend, you must pardon me, Mr. Allworthy, answered Sophia. I cannot listen to a proposal of this kind. Mr. Jones, I am convinced, hath much merit, but I shall never receive Mr. Jones as one who is to be my husband. Upon my honour, I never will. Pardon me, madam, cries Allworthy, if I am a little surprised. After what I have heard from Mr. Western, I hope the unhappy young man hath done nothing to forfeit your good opinion, if he had ever the honour to enjoy it. Perhaps he may have been misrepresented to you, as he was to me. The same villainy may have injured him everywhere. He is no murderer, I assure you, as he hath been called. Mr. Allworthy, answered Sophia, I have told you my, res I have told you my resolution. I wonder not at what my father hath told you. But whatever his apprehensions or fears have been, if I know my heart, I have given no occasion for them, since it hath always been a fixed principle with me, never to have married without his consent. This is to think the duty of a child to a parent, and this, I hope, nothing could ever have prevailed with me to swerve from. I do not indeed conceive that the authority of any parent can oblige us to marry in direct opposition to our inclinations. To avoid a force of this kind, which I had reason to suspect, I left my father's house and sought protection elsewhere. This is the truth of my story, and if the world, or my father, carry my intentions any farther, my own conscience will acquit me. I hear you, Miss Western, cries Allworthy, with admiration. I admire the justness of your sentiments, but surely there is more in this. I am cautious of offending you, young lady, but I am to look on all which I have hitherto heard or seen as a dream only? And have you suffered so much cruelty from your father on the account of a man to whom you have been always absolutely indifferent? I beg, Mr. Allworthy, answered Sophia, I will not, Mr. Allworthy, conceal. I will be very sincere with you. I own I had a great opinion of Mr. Jones, I believe. I know I have suffered from my opinion. I have been treated cruelly by my aunt, 
as well as by my father, but that is now past. I beg I may not be farther pressed, for whatever hath been, my resolution is now fixed. Your nephew, sir, hath many virtues. He hath great virtues, Mr. Allworthy. I question not, but he will do you honour in the world, and make you happy. I wish I could make him so, madam, replied Allworthy, but that I am convinced is only in your power. It is that conviction which hath made me so earnest a solicitor in his favour. You are deceived indeed, sir, you are deceived, said Sophia. I hope not by him. It is sufficient to have deceived me. Mr. Alworthy, I must insist on being pressed no further on this subject. I should be sorry. Nay, I will not injure him in your favour. I wish Mr. Jones very well. I sincerely wish him well. And I repeat it again to you, whatever demerit he may have to me, I am certain he hath many good qualities. I do not disown my former thoughts, but nothing can ever recall them. At present there is not a man upon earth whom I would more resolutely reject than Mr. Jones, nor would the addresses of Mr. Billfield himself be less, to, be less agreeable to me. Western had been long impatient for the events of this conference, and was just now arrived at the door to listen, when having heard the last sentiments of his daughter's heart, he lost all temper, and bursting open the door in a rage, cried out, "'It is a lie! It is a d blanked and lie! It is all owing to that d blanked and rascal Jones, and if she could get at him, she'd had him any hour of the day!' Here Allworthy interposed, and addressing himself to the squire with some anger in his look, he said, "'Mr. Western, you have not kept your word with me. You promised to abstain from all violence.' "'Why, so I did,' cries Western, as long as it was possible. "'But to hear a wench telling such confounded lies, zounds, doth she think, "'if she can make vools of other volk, she can make one of me? "'No, no, I know her better than thee dost.' "'I am sorry to tell you, sir,' answered Allworthy, "'it doth not appear by your behaviour to this young lady "'that ye may know her at all. "'I beg pardon for what I say, but I think our intimacy—' your own desires, and the occasion justify me. She is your daughter, Mr. Western, and I think she doth honour to your name. If I was capable of envy, I should sooner envy you on this account than any other man whatever. Odd rabbit it, cries the squire. I wish she was thine, with all my heart. Would soon be glad to be rid of the trouble of her. Indeed, my good friend, answered Allworthy, you yourself are the cause of all the trouble you complain of. Place that confidence in the young lady which she so well deserves, and I am certain you will be the happiest father on earth. I confidence in her, cries the squire. Splod, what confidence can I place in her, when she won't do as I ha' her? Let her give but her consent to marry, as I would ha' her, and I'll place as much confidence in her as wouldst have me. You have no right, neighbour, answered Allworthy, to insist on any such consent. A negative voice your daughter allows you, and God and nature have thought power to allow you no more. A negative voice, cries the squire. Ay, ay, I'll show you what a negative voice I ha. Go along, go into your chamber, go you stubborn. Indeed, Mr. Western, said Mr. Allworthy, indeed you use her cruelly. I cannot bear to see you this. You shall, you must behave to her in a kinder manner. She deserves the best of treatment. Yes, yes said the squire. I know what she deserves. Now she's gone. I'll show you what she deserves. See here, sir. Here is a letter from my cousin, my lady Belliston, in which she is so kind to give me to understand that the fellow is got out of prison again, and here she advises me to take all the care I can of the wench. Obzookers! Neighbor Allworthy, you don't know what it is to govern a daughter. The squire ended his speech with some compliments to his own sagacity, and then Allworthy, after a formal preface, acquainted him with the whole discovery which he had made concerning Jones, with his anger to Billfield, and with every particular which hath been disclosed to the reader in the preceding chapters. Men, over-violent in their dispositions, are, for the most part, as changeable in them. No sooner then was Mr. Western informed of Mr. Allworthy's intention to make Jones his heir, than he joined heartily with the uncle in every commendation of the nephew, and became as eager for her marriage with Jones, as he had before been, to couple her to Billfield. Here Mr. Allworthy was again forced to interpose, 
and to relate what had passed between him and Sophia, at which he testified great surprise. The squire was silent a moment, and looked wild with astonishment at this account. At last he cried out, "'Why, what can be the meaning of this, neighbour Alworthy? What a one she was, that I'll be sworn to. A zookers! I have hit at it. As sure as a gun, I have hit o' the very right of it. It's all along a zister. The girl hath got a hankering after this son of a whore of a lord. I have found them together at my cousin, my lady Bellaston's. He hath turned the head of her, that's certain, but d blank and me if he shall ha her. I'll had no lords nor courtiers in my family. Alworthy now made a long speech, in which he repeated his resolution to avoid all violent measures, and very earnestly recommended gentle methods to Mr. Western, as those by which he might be assured of succeeding best with his daughter. He then took his leave, and returned back to Mrs. Miller, but was forced to comply with the earnest entreaties of the squire, in promising to bring Mr. Jones to visit him that afternoon, where he might, as he said, make all matters up with the young gentleman. At Mr. Allworthy's departure, Western promised to follow his advice in his behaviour to Sophia, saying, I don't know how it is, but deem blank and me, Allworthy, if you don't make me always do just as you please, and yet I have as good an estate as you, and am in the commission of the great peace as well as yourself. End of Book 18, Chapter 7-9 through 9. Read by Jennifer Stearns, Concord, New Hampshire Section 65 of Tom Jones. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. Book 18, Chapter 10. Wherein the history begins to draw towards a conclusion. When Allworthy returned to his lodgings, he heard Mr. Jones was just arrived before him. He hurried, therefore, instantly into an empty chamber, whither he ordered Mr. Jones to be brought to him alone. It is impossible to conceive a more tender or moving scene than the meeting between the uncle and nephew, for Mrs. Waters, as the reader may well suppose, had at her last visit discovered to him the secret of his birth. The first agonies of joy which were felt on both sides are indeed beyond my power to describe. I shall not, therefore, attempt it. After Allworthy had raised Jones from his feet, where he had prostrated himself, and received him into his arms. "'Oh, my child!' he cried. "'How have I been to blame? How have I injured you? What amends can I ever make you for those unkind, those unjust suspicions which I have entertained, and for all the sufferings they have occasioned to you?' "'Am I not now made amends?' cries Jones. Would not my sufferings, if they had been ten times greater, have been now richly repaid? Oh, my dear uncle, this goodness, this tenderness overpowers, unmans, destroys me. I cannot bear the transports which flow so fast upon me. To be again restored to your presence, to your favour, to be once more thus kindly received by my great, my noble, my generous benefactor. Indeed, child, cries Allworthy. I have used you cruelly. He then explained to him all the treachery of Blifil, and again repeated expressions of the utmost concern for having been induced by that treachery to use him so ill. Oh, talk not so, answered Jones. Indeed, sir, you have used me nobly. The wisest man might be deceived as you were, and, under such a deception, the best must have acted just as you did. Your goodness displayed itself in the midst of your anger, just as it then seemed— I owe everything to that goodness of which I have been most unworthy. Do not put me on self-accusation by carrying your generous sentiments too far. Alas, sir, I have not been punished more than I have deserved, and it shall be the whole business of my future life to deserve that happiness you now bestow on me. For, believe me, my dear uncle, my punishment hath not been thrown away upon me. Though I have been a great, I am not a hardened sinner." I thank heaven I have had time to reflect on my past life, where, though I cannot charge myself with any gross villainy, yet I can discern follies and vices more than enough to repent and to be ashamed of. Follies which have been attended with dreadful consequences to myself, and have brought me to the brink of destruction. 
"'I am rejoiced, my dear child,' answered Allworthy, "'to hear you talk thus sensibly, for as I am convinced hypocrisy, "'good heaven, how have I been imposed on by it in others, "'was never among your faults, so I can readily believe all you say. "'You now see, Tom, to what dangers imprudence alone may subject virtue, "'for virtue, I am now convinced, you love in a great degree.' Prudence is indeed the duty which we owe to ourselves, and if we will be so much our own enemies as to neglect it, we are not to wonder if the world is deficient in discharging their duty to us. For when a man lays the foundation of his own ruin, others will, I am afraid, be too apt to build upon it. You say, however, you have seen your errors, and will reform them. I firmly believe you, my dear child." and therefore from this moment you shall never be reminded of them by me. Remember them only yourself, so far as for the future to teach you the better to avoid them. But still remember, for your comfort, that there is this great difference between those faults which candour may construe into imprudence, and those which can be deduced from villainy only. The former, perhaps, are even more apt to subject a man to ruin, but if he reform, his character will, at length, be totally retrieved. The world, though not immediately, will in time be reconciled to him, and he may reflect, not without some mixture of pleasure, on the dangers he hath escaped. But villainy, my boy, when once discovered, is irretrievable. The stains which this leaves behind, no time will wash away. The censures of mankind will pursue the wretch, their scorn will abash him in public, and if shame drives him into retirement, he will go to it with all those terrors with which a wary child, who is afraid of hobgoblins, retreats from company to go to bed alone. Here his murdered conscience will haunt him. Repose, like a false friend, will fly from him. Wherever he turns his eyes, horror presents itself. If he looks backward, unavailable repentance treads on his heels. If forward, incurable despair stares him in the face till like a condemned prisoner confined in a dungeon he detests his present condition and yet dreads the consequence of that hour which is to relieve him from it comfort yourself i say my child that this is not your case and rejoice with thankfulness to him who hath suffered you to see your errors before they have brought on you that destruction to which a persistence in even those errors must have led you you have deserted them and the prospect now before you is such that happiness seems in your own power. At these words Jones fetched a deep sigh, upon which, when Allworthy remonstrated, he said, Sir, I will conceal nothing from you. I fear there is one consequence of my vices I shall never be able to retrieve. Oh, my dear uncle, I have lost a treasure. You need say no more, answered Allworthy. I will be explicit with you. I know what you lament. I have seen the young lady, and have discoursed with her concerning you. This I must insist on, as an earnest of your sincerity in all you have said, and of the steadfastness of your resolution, that you obey me in one instance. To abide entirely by the determination of the young lady, whether it shall be in your favour or no. She hath already suffered enough from solicitations which I hate to think of. She shall owe no further constraint to my family. I know her father will be as ready to torment her now on your account as he hath formerly been on another's, but I am determined she shall suffer no more confinement, no more violence, no more uneasy hours. Oh, my dear uncle, answered Jones, lay, I beseech you, some command on me in which I shall have some merit in obedience. Believe me, sir, the only instance in which I could disobey you would be to give an uneasy moment to my Sophia. No, sir, if I am so miserable to have incurred her displeasure beyond all hope of forgiveness, that alone, with the dreadful reflection of causing her misery, will be sufficient to overpower me. To call Sophia mine is the greatest, and now the only additional blessing which heaven can bestow. But it is a blessing which I must owe to her alone." "'I will not flatter you, child,' cries Allworthy. "'I fear your case is desperate. "'I never saw stronger marks of an unalterable resolution in any person "'than appeared in her vehement declarations against receiving your addresses, "'for which, perhaps, you can account better than myself.' 
"'Oh, sir, I can account too well,' answered Jones. "'I have sinned against her beyond all hope of pardon, and guilty as I am, my guilt unfortunately appears to her in ten times blacker than the real colours. Oh, my dear uncle, I find my follies are irretrievable, and all your goodness cannot save me from perdition. A servant now acquainted them that Mr. Weston was below stairs, for his eagerness to see Jones could not wait till the afternoon. Upon which Jones, whose eyes were full of tears, begged his uncle to entertain Weston a few minutes, till he a little recovered himself, to which the good man consented, and, having ordered Mr. Weston to be shown into a parlour, went down to him. Mrs. Miller no sooner heard that Jones was alone, for she had not yet seen him since his release from prison, than she came eagerly into the room, and, advancing towards Jones, wished him heartily joy of his new-found uncle and his happy reconciliation, adding, "'I wish I could give you joy on another account, my dear child.' but anything so inexorable I never saw. Jones, with some appearance of surprise, asked her what she meant. "'Why, then,' says she, "'I have been with your young lady, and have explained all matters to her, as they were told to me by my son Nightingale. She can have no longer any doubt about the letter. Of that I am certain, for I told her my son Nightingale was ready to take his oath, if she pleased, that it was all his own invention, and the letter of his inditing.' I told her the very reason of sending the letter ought to recommend you to her the more, as it was all upon her account, and a plain proof that you was resolved to quit all your profligacy for the future, that you had never been guilty of a single instance of infidelity to her since your seeing her in town. I am afraid I went too far there, but, heaven forgive me, I hope your future behaviour will be my justification. I am sure I have said all I can— but all to no purpose. She remains inflexible. She says she had forgiven many faults on account of youth, but expressed such detestation of the character of a libertine that she absolutely silenced me. I often attempted to excuse you, but the justness of her accusation flew in my face. Upon my honour, she is a lovely woman, and one of the sweetest and most sensible creatures I ever saw. I could have almost kissed her for one expression she made use of. It was a sentiment worthy of Seneca, or of a bishop. "'I once fancied, madam,' said she, "'I had discovered great goodness of heart in Mr. Jones, and for that, I own, I had a sincere esteem. But an entire profligacy of manners will corrupt the best heart in the world, and all which a good-natured libertine can expect is that we should mix some grains of pity with our contempt and abhorrence.' She's an angelic creature, that's the truth on it. Oh, Mrs. Miller, answered Jones, can I bear to think that I've lost such an angel? Lost? No, cries Mrs. Miller. I hope you have not lost her yet. Resolve to leave such vicious courses, and you may yet have hopes. Nay, if she would remain inexorable, there is another young lady, a sweet, pretty young lady, and a swinging fortune who is absolutely dying for love of you. I heard of it this very morning, and I told it to Miss Weston. Nay, I went a little beyond the truth again, for I told her you had refused her. But indeed I knew you would refuse her. And here I must give you a little comfort. When I mentioned the young lady's name, who is no other than the pretty widow Hunt, I thought she turned pale. But when I said you had refused her, I will be sworn her face was all over scarlet in an instant." and these were her very words. I will not deny, but that I believe he has some affection for me. Here the conversation was interrupted by the arrival of Weston, who could no longer be kept out of the room even by the authority of Allworthy himself, though this, as we have often seen, had a wonderful power over him. Weston immediately went up to Jones, crying out, "'My old friend Tom, I am glad to see thee with all my heart,' All past must be forgotten. I could not intend any affront to thee, because, as already here knows, nay, dost know it thyself, I took thee for another person. And where a body means no harm, what signifies a hasty word or two? One Christian must forget and forgive another. I hope, sir, said Jones, I shall never forget the many obligations I have had to you. But as for any offence towards me, I declare I am an utter stranger. That's says Weston. Then give me thy fist. 
had as hearty an honest cock as any in the kingdom. Come along with me, I'll carry thee to thy mistress this moment. Here Allworthy interposed, and the squire being unable to prevail either with the uncle or nephew, was, after some litigation, obliged to consent to delay introducing Jones to Sophia till the afternoon, at which time Allworthy, as well in compassion to Jones as in compliance with the eager desires of Weston, was prevailed upon to promise to attend at the tea-table. The conversation which now ensued was pleasant enough, and with which, had it happened earlier in our history, we would have entertained our reader, but as we have now leisure only to attend to what is very material, it shall suffice to say that, matters being entirely adjusted as to the afternoon visit, Mr. Weston again returned home. CHAPTER Eleven, THE HISTORY DRAWS NEARER TO A CONCLUSION When Mr. Weston was departed, Jones began to inform Mr. Allworthy and Mrs. Miller that his liberty had been procured by two noble lords, who, together with two surgeons and a friend of Mr. Nightingale's, had attended the magistrate by whom he had been committed, and by whom, on the surgeon's oath that the wounded person was out of all manner of danger from his wound, he was discharged. One only of these lords, he said, he had ever seen before, and that no more than once, but the other had greatly surprised him by asking his pardon for an offence he had been guilty of towards him, occasioned, he said, entirely by his ignorance who he was. Now, the reality of the case, with which Jones was not acquainted till afterwards, was this. The lieutenant, whom Lord Fellamar had employed, according to the advice of Lady Bellaston, to press Jones as a vagabond into the sea-service, when he came to report to his lordship the event which we have before seen, spoke very favourably of the behaviour of Mr. Jones on all accounts, and strongly assured that lord that he must have mistaken the person, for that Jones was certainly a gentleman, insomuch that his lordship, who was strictly a man of honour, and would by no means have been guilty of an action which the world in general would have condemned, began to be much concerned for the advice which he had taken. Within a day or two after this, Lord Fellamar happened to dine with the Irish peer, who, in a conversation upon the duel, acquainted his company with the character of Fitzpatrick, to which, indeed, he did not do strict justice, especially in what related to his lady. He said she was the most innocent, the most injured woman alive, and that from compassion alone he had undertaken her cause. He then declared an intention of going the next morning to Fitzpatrick's lodgings, in order to prevail with him, if possible, to consent to a separation from his wife, who, the peer said, was in apprehensions for her life, if she should ever return to be under the power of her husband. Lord Fellamar agreed to go with him, that he might satisfy himself more concerning Jones and the circumstances of the duel, for he was by no means easy concerning the part he had acted. The moment his lordship gave a hint of his readiness to assist in the delivery of the lady, it was eagerly embraced by the other nobleman, who depended much on the authority of Lord Fellamar, as he thought it would greatly contribute to all Fitzpatrick into a compliance, and perhaps he was in the right, for the poor Irishman no sooner saw these noble peers had undertaken the cause of his wife than he submitted, and articles of separation were soon drawn up and signed between the parties. Fitzpatrick, who had been so well satisfied by Mrs. Waters concerning the innocence of his wife with Jones at Upton, or perhaps from some other reasons, was now become so indifferent to that matter that he spoke highly in favour of Jones to Lord Fellamar, took all the blame upon himself, and said the other had behaved very much like a gentleman and a man of honour, and upon that lord's further inquiry concerning Mr. Jones, Fitzpatrick told him he was nephew to a gentleman of very great fashion and fortune, which was the account he had just received from Mrs. Waters after her interview with Dowling. Lord Fellamar now thought it behoved him to do everything in his power to make satisfaction to a gentleman whom he had so grossly injured, and without any consideration of rivalship, for he had now given over all thoughts of Sophia, determined to procure Mr. Jones's liberty, being satisfied, as well from Fitzpatrick as his surgeon, that the wound was not mortal. He therefore prevailed with the Irish peer to accompany him to the place where Jones was confined, to whom he behaved as we have already related. When Allworthy returned to his lodgings, he immediately carried Jones into his room, and then acquainted him with the whole matter, as well what he had heard from Mrs. Waters as what he had discovered from Mr. Dowling. Jones expressed great astonishment and no less concern at this account, but without making any comment or observation upon it. And now a message was brought from Mr. Bliffle, desiring to know if his uncle was at leisure that he might wait upon him. Allworthy started and turned pale, 
and then, in a more passionate tone than I believe he had ever used before, bid the servant tell Bliffle he knew him not. "'Consider, dear sir,' cries Jones, in a trembling voice. "'I have considered,' answered Allworthy, "'and you yourself shall carry my message to the villain. No one can carry him the sentence of his own ruin so properly as the man whose ruin he hath so villainously contrived.' "'Pardon me, dear sir,' said Jones. "'A moment's reflection will, I am sure, convince you of the contrary. What might perhaps be but justice from another tongue, would from mine be insult, and to whom? My own brother, and your nephew. Nor did he use me so barbarously. Indeed, that would have been more inexcusable than anything he has done. Fortune may tempt men of no very bad dispositions to injustice, but insults proceed only from black and rancorous minds, and have no temptations to excuse them. Let me beseech you, sir, to do nothing by him in the present height of your anger. Consider, my dear uncle, I was not myself condemned unheard. Allworthy stood silent a moment, and then, embracing Jones, he said, with tears gushing from his eyes, "'Oh, my child, to what goodness have I been so long blind!' Mrs. Miller, entering the room at that moment, after a gentle rap which was not perceived, and seeing Jones in the arms of his uncle, the poor woman, in an agony of joy, fell upon her knees, and burst forth into the most ecstatic thanksgivings to heaven for what had happened. Then, running to Jones, she embraced him eagerly, crying, "'My dearest friend, I wish you joy a thousand and a thousand times of this blessed day!' And next Mr. Allworthy himself received the same congratulations, to which he answered, Indeed, indeed, Mrs. Miller, I am beyond expression happy. Some few more raptures having passed on all sides, Mrs. Miller desired them both to walk down to dinner in the parlour, where she said there were a very happy set of people assembled, being indeed no other than Mr. Nightingale and his bride, and his cousin Harriet with her bridegroom. Allworthy excused himself from dining with the company, saying he had ordered some little thing for him and his nephew in his own apartment, for that they had much private business to discourse of but would not resist promising the good woman that both he and Jones would make part of her society at supper. Mrs. Miller then asked what was to be done with Bliffle. "'For indeed,' says she, "'I cannot be easy while such a villain is in my house.' Allworthy answered. He was as uneasy as herself on the same account. "'Oh!' cries she, "'if that be the case, leave the matter to me. I'll soon show him the outside out of my doors, I warrant you.' Here are two or three lusty fellows below stairs. There will be no need of any violence, cries Allworthy. If you carry him a message from me, he will, I am convinced, depart of his own accord. Will I? said Mrs. Miller. I never did anything in my life with a better will. Here Jones interfered, and said he had considered the matter better, and would, if Mr. Allworthy pleased, be himself the messenger. I know, says he, already enough of your pleasure, sir, and I beg leave to acquaint him with it by my own words. Let me beseech you, sir, added he, to reflect on the dreadful consequences of driving him to violent and sudden despair. How unfit, alas, is this poor man to die in his present situation! This suggestion had not the least effect on Mrs. Miller. She left the room, crying, You are too good, Mr. Jones, infinitely too good to live in this world but it made a deeper impression on Allworthy. "'My good child,' said he, "'I am equally astonished at the goodness of your heart and the quickness of your understanding. Heaven indeed forbid that this wretch should be deprived of any means or time for repentance. That would be a shocking consideration indeed. Go to him, therefore, and use your own discretion. Yet do not flatter him with any hopes of my forgiveness, for I shall never forgive villainy farther than my religion obliges me, and that extends not either to our bounty or our conversation. Jones went up to Bliffle's room, whom he found in a situation which moved his pity, though it would have raised a less amiable passion in many beholders. He cast himself on his bed, where he lay abandoning himself to despair, and drowned in tears, not in such tears as flow from contrition and wash away guilt from minds which have been seduced or surprised into it unawares, against the bent of their natural dispositions, 
as will sometimes happen from human frailty, even to the good. No, these tears were such as the frighted thief sheds in his card, and are indeed the effects of that concern which the most savage natures are seldom deficient in feeling for themselves. It would be unpleasant and tedious to paint this scene in full length. Let it suffice to say that the behaviour of Jones was kind to excess. He omitted nothing which his invention could supply to raise and comfort the drooping spirits of Bliffle before he communicated to him the resolution of his uncle that he must quit the house that evening. He offered to furnish him with any money he wanted, assured him of his hearty forgiveness of all he had done against him, that he would endeavour to live with him hereafter as a brother, and would leave nothing unattempted to effectuate a reconciliation with his uncle. Bliffle was at first sullen and silent, balancing in his mind whether he should yet deny all. But, finding at last the evidence too strong against him, he betook himself at last to confession. He then asked pardon of his brother in the most vehement manner, prostrated himself on the ground, and kissed his feet. In short, he was now as remarkably mean as he had been before remarkably wicked. Jones could not so far check his disdain, but that it a little discovered itself in his countenance at this extreme civility. He raised his brother the moment he could from the ground, and advised him to bear his afflictions more like a man, repeating at the same time his promises that he would do all in his power to lessen them, for which Bliffle, making many professions of his unworthiness, poured forth a profusion of thanks, and then, he having declared he would immediately depart to another lodging, Jones returned to his uncle. Among other matters, Allworthy now acquainted Jones with the discovery which he had made concerning the five hundred pound banknotes. "'I have,' said he, "'already consulted a lawyer who tells me, to my great astonishment, that there is no punishment for a fraud of this kind. Indeed, when I consider the black ingratitude of this fellow toward you, I think a highwayman compared to him is an innocent person.' "'Good heavens!' says Jones. "'Is it possible? I am shocked beyond measure at this news. I thought there was not an honester fellow in the world. The temptation of such a sum was too great for him to withstand, for smaller matters have come safe to me through his hand. Indeed, my dear uncle, you must suffer me to call it weakness rather than ingratitude, for I am convinced the poor fellow loves me, and hath done me some kindnesses, which I can never forget. Nay, I believe he hath repented of this very act.' for it is not above a day or two ago, when my affairs seemed in the most desperate situation, that he visited me in my confinement, and offered me any money I wanted. Consider, sir, what a temptation to a man who hath tasted such bitter distress it must be to have a sum in his possession which must put him and his family beyond any future possibility of suffering the like. "'Child,' cries Allworthy, "'you carry this forgiving temper too far.' Such mistaken mercy is not only weakness, but borders on injustice, and is very pernicious to society, as it encourages vice. The dishonesty of this fellow I might perhaps have pardoned, but never his ingratitude. And give me leave to say, when we suffer any temptation to atone for dishonesty itself, we are as candid and merciful as we ought to be, and so far I confess I have gone, for I have often pitied the fate of a highwayman when I have been on the grand jury, and have more than once applied to the judge on the behalf of such as have had any mitigating circumstances in their case. But when dishonesty is attended with any blacker crime, such as cruelty, murder, ingratitude, or the like, compassion and forgiveness then become faults. I am convinced the fellow is a villain, and he shall be punished, at least as far as I can punish him. This was spoken with so stern a voice that Jones did not think proper to make any reply. Besides, the hour appointed by Mr. Weston now drew so near that he had barely time left to dress himself. Here, therefore, ended the present dialogue, and Jones retired to another room, where Partridge attended, according to order, with his clothes. Partridge had scarce seen his master since the happy discovery. The poor fellow was unable either to contain or express his transports. He behaved like one frantic, and made almost as many mistakes while he was dressing Jones as I have seen made by Harlequin in dressing himself on the stage. His memory, however, was not in the least deficient. He recollected now many omens and presages of this happy event, 
some of which he had remarked at the time, but many more he now remembered. Nor did he omit the dreams he had dreamt the evening before his meeting with Jones, and concluded with saying, "'I always told your honour something boded in my mind that you would one time or other have it in your power to make my fortune.' Jones assured him that this boding should as certainly be verified with regard to him as all the other omens had been to himself, which did not a little add to all the raptures which the poor fellow had already conceived on account of his master. End of section 65「Book eighteen, chapter twelve, the history of Tom Jones, a foundling, by Henry Fielding. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, go to LibriVox.org. Recording by Maureen Blasky. The History of Tom Jones, a Foundling, by Henry Fielding. Book 18, Chapter 12 Approaching Still Nearer to the End Jones, being now completely dressed, attended his uncle to Mr. Western's. He was indeed one of the finest figures ever beheld, and his person alone would have charmed the greater part of womankind, but we hope it hath already appeared in this history that nature, when she formed him, did not totally rely as she sometimes doth on this merit only to recommend her work sophia who angry as she was was likewise set forth to the best advantage for which i leave my female readers to account appeared so extremely beautiful that even allworthy when he saw her could not forbear whispering western that he believed she was the finest creature in the world to which Western answered in a whisper, overheard by all present, so much the better for Tom, for damn me if she shan't have the tossling her. Sophia was all over scarlet at these words, while Tom's countenance was altogether as pale, and he was almost ready to sink from his chair. The tea-table was scarce removed before Western lugged Allworthy out of the room, telling him he had business of consequence to impart, and must speak to him that instant in private before he forgot it. The lovers were now alone, and it will, I question not, appear strange to many readers, that those who had so much to say to one another, when danger and difficulty attended their conversation, and who seemed so eager to rush into each other's arms when so many bars lay in their way, now that with safety they were at liberty to say or do whatever they pleased, should both remain for some time silent and motionless, insomuch that a stranger of moderate sagacity might have well concluded they were mutually indifferent. But so it was, however strange it may seem, both sat with their eyes cast downwards on the ground, and for some minutes continued in perfect silence. Mr. Jones, during this interval, attempted once or twice to speak, but was absolutely incapable, muttering only, or rather sighing out, some broken words. When Sophia, at length, partly out of pity to him, and partly to turn the discourse from the subject which she knew well enough he was endeavouring to open, said, Sure, sir, you are the most fortunate man in the world in this discovery. And can you really, madam, think me so fortunate, said Joan, sighing, while I have incurred your displeasure? Nay, sir, said she, as to that you best know whether you have deserved it. Indeed, madam, answered he, you yourself are as well apprised of all my demerits. Mrs. Miller hath acquainted you with the whole truth. Oh, my Sophia, am I never to hope for forgiveness? I think, Mr. Jones, said she, I may almost depend on your own justice, and leave it to yourself to pass sentence on your own conduct. Alas, answered he, it is mercy, and not justice, which I implore at your hands. Justice, I know, must condemn me, 
yet not for the letter i sent to lady belliston of that i most solemnly declare you have had a true account he then insisted much on the security given him by nightingale of a fair pretence of breaking off if contrary to their expectations her ladyship should have accepted his offer but confessed that he had been guilty of a great indiscretion to put such a letter as that into her power which said he i have dearly paid for in the effect it has upon you i do not i cannot says she believe otherwise of that letter than you would have me my conduct i think shows you clearly i do not believe there is much in that and yet mr jones have i not enough to resent after what passed at upton so soon to engage in a new amour with another woman while i fancied and you pretended your heart was bleeding for me indeed you have acted strangely can i believe the passion you have professed to me to be sincere or if i can what happiness can i assure myself of with a man capable of so much inconstancy o oh, my sophia cries he do not doubt the sincerity of the purest passion that ever inflamed a human breast think most adorable creature of my unhappy situation of my despair could i my sophia have flattered myself with the most distant hopes of ever being permitted to throw myself at your feet in the manner i do now it would not have been in the power of any other woman to have inspired a thought which the severest chastity could have condemned inconstancy to you oh, sophia if you can have goodness enough to pardon what is past do not let any cruel future apprehensions shut your mercy against me no repentance was ever more sincere oh let it reconcile me to my heaven in this dear bosom sincere repentance mr jones answered she will obtain the pardon of a sinner but it is from one who is a perfect judge of that sincerity a human mind may be imposed on nor is there any infallible method to prevent it you must expect however that if i can be prevailed on by your repentance to pardon you i will at least insist on the strongest proof of its sincerity name any proof in my power answered jones eagerly time replied she time alone mr jones can convince me that you are a true penitent and have resolved to abandon these vicious courses which i should detest you for if i imagined you capable of persevering in them do not imagine it cries jones on my knees i entreat i implore your confidence a confidence which it shall be the business of my life to deserve let it then said she be the business of some part of your life to show me you deserve it i think i have been explicit enough in assuring you that when i see you merit my confidence you will obtain it after what has passed sir can you expect i should take you upon your word he replied do not believe me upon my word i have a better security a pledge for my constancy which it is impossible to see and to doubt what is that said sophia a little surprised i will show you my charming angel cried jones seizing her hand and carrying her to the glass there behold it there in that lovely figure that face that shape those eyes the mind which shines through these eyes can the man who shall be in possession of these be inconstant impossible my sophia they would fix a dormant a lord rochester you could not doubt it if you could see with any eyes but your own sophia blushed and half smiled but forcing again her brow into a frown if i am to judge said she of the future by the past my image will no more remain in your heart when i am out of your sight than it will in this glass when i am out of the room by heaven by all that is sacred said jones it never was out of my heart 
the delicacy of your sex cannot conceive the grossness of ours nor how little one sort of amour has to do with the heart i will never marry a man replied sophia very gravely who shall not learn refinement enough to be as incapable as i am of making such a distinction i will learn it said jones i have learnt it already the first moment of hope that my sophia might be my wife taught it me at once and all the rest of her sex from that moment became as little the objects of desire to my sense as of passion to my heart well says sophia the proof of this must be from time your situation mr jones is now altered and i assure you i have great satisfaction in the alteration you will now want no opportunity of being near me and convincing me that your mind is altered too oh my angel cries jones how shall i thank thy goodness and are you so good to own that you have a satisfaction in my prosperity believe me believe me madam it is you alone have given relish to that prosperity since i owe it to the dear hope oh my sophia let it not be a distant one i will be all obedience to your commands i will not dare to press anything further than you permit me yet let me entreat you to appoint a short trial oh tell me when i may expect you will be convinced of what is most solemnly true when i have gone voluntarily thus far mr jones i expect not to be pressed nay i will not oh don't look unkindly thus my sophia cries he i do not i dare not press you yet permit me at least once more to beg you would fix the period now consider the impatience of love a twelvemonth perhaps said she oh my sophia cries he you have named an eternity perhaps it may be something sooner says she I will not be teased. If your passion for me be what I would have it, I think you may now be easy. Easy, Sophia, call not such an exalting happiness as mine by so cold a name. O oh, transporting thought, am I not assured that the blessed day will come when I shall call you mine? When fear shall be no more, when I shall have that dear, that vast, that exquisite, ecstatic delight of making my Sophia happy? indeed sir said she that day is in your power oh my dear my divine angel cried he these words have made me mad with joy but i must i will thank those dear lips which have so sweetly pronounced my bliss he then caught her in his arms and kissed her with an ardour he had never ventured before at this instant western who had stood some time listening burst into the room and with his hunting voice and phrase cried out to her boy to her go to her that's it little honeys oh that's it well what is it all over hath she appointed the day boy what shall it be to-morrow or next day it shan't be put off a minute longer than next day i am resolved let me beseech you sir says jones don't let me be the occasion beseech mine cries western i thought thou hast been a lad of higher mettle than to give way to a parcel of maidenish tricks i tell thee tis all flimflam the dukers she'd have the wedding to-night with all her heart would's not sophie come confess and be an honest girl for once what art dumb why dost not speak why should i confess sir says sophia since it seems you are so well acquainted with my thoughts that's a good girl cries he and dost consent then no indeed sir says sophia i have given no such consent and would not hae then to-morrow nor next day says western indeed sir says she i have no such intention but i can tell thee replied he why thou hast not 
only because thou dost love to be disobedient and to plague and vex thy father. Pray, sir, said Jones, interfering. I tell thee thou art a puppy, cries he. When I forbid her, then it was all nothing but sighing and whining and languishing and writing. Now I am for thee, she is against thee, all the spirit of contrary, that's all. She is above being guided and governed by her father, that is the whole truth on it. It is only to disoblige and contradict me. What would my papa have me do? cries Sophia. What would I have thee do? says he. Why, gin I am this moment? Well, sir, says Sophia, I will obey you. There is my hand, Mr. Jones. Well, and will you consent to aye on to-morrow morning, says Western? I will be obedient to you, sir, cries she. Why, then, to-morrow morning be the day, cries he. Why, then, to-morrow morning shall be the day, papa, since you will have it so, says Sophia. Jones then fell upon his knees and kissed her hand in an agony of joy, while Western began to caper and dance about the room, presently crying out, Where the devil is Allworthy? He is without now, a-talking with that damned lawyer Dowling, when he should be minding other matters. He then sailed out in quest of him in very opportunely, left the lovers to enjoy a few tender minutes alone but he soon returned with Allworthy, saying, If you won't believe me, you may ask her yourself. Hast not gin thy consent, Sophie, to be married to-morrow? Such are your commands, sir, cries Sophia, and I dare not be guilty of disobedience. I hope, madam, cries Allworthy, my nephew will merit so much goodness, and will always be as sensible as myself of the great honour you have done my family. An alliance with so charming and so excellent a young lady would indeed be an honour to the greatest in England. Yes, cries Western, but if I had suffered her to stand shill I shall at dilly-dally, you might not have had that honour yet a while. I was forced to use a little fatherly authority to bring her to. I hope not, cries Allworthy. I hope there is not the least constraint. Why, there, cries Western, you may bid her on say all again, if you will. Dost repent heartily of thy promise, dost not, Sophia? Indeed, Papa, cries she, I do not repent, nor do I believe I ever shall of any promise in favour of Mr. Jones. Then, nephew, cries Allworthy, I felicitate you most heartily, for I think you are the happiest of men. And, madam, you will give me leave to congratulate you on this joyful occasion? Indeed, I am convinced you have bestowed yourself on one who will be sensible of your great merit, and who will at least use his best endeavours to deserve it. His best endeavours, cries Western, that he will, I warrant, and hark ye all worthy, I'll bet thee five pounds to a crown we have a boy to-morrow nine months. But, prithee, tell me what would ha, would ha burgundy, champagne, or what, for please Jupiter, we will make a night on it. Indeed, sir, said Allworthy, you must excuse me, both my nephew and I were engaged before I suspected this near approach of his happiness. Engaged, quoth the squire, never tell me, I won't part with thee to-night upon any occasion. Shalt sup here, please the Lord Harry. You must pardon me, my dear neighbour, answered Allworthy. I have given a solemn promise, and that you know I never break. Why, prithee, who art engaged to? cries the squire. Allworthy then informed him, as likewise, of the company. Odd zookers, answered the squire, I will go with thee, and so shall Sophie, for I won't part with thee to-night, and it would be barbarous to part Tom and the girl. This offer was presently embraced by Allworthy, and Sophia consented, having first obtained a private promise from her father, that he would not mention a syllable concerning her marriage. End of chapter 12 Book 18 Chapter 13 
in which the history is concluded. Young Nightingale had been that afternoon by appointment to wait on his father, who received him much more kindly than he expected. There, likewise, he met his uncle, who is returned to town in quest of his new-married daughter. This marriage was the luckiest incident which could have happened to the young gentleman, for these brothers lived in a constant state of contention about the government of their children, both heartily despising the method which each other took. Each of them therefore now endeavoured as much as he could to palliate the offence which his own child committed, and to aggravate the match of the other. This desire of triumphing over his brother, added to the many arguments which Allworthy had used, so strongly operated on the old gentleman, that he met his son with a smiling countenance, and actually agreed to sup with him that evening at Mrs. Miller's. As for the other, who really loved his daughter with the most immoderate affection, there was little difficulty in inclining him to a reconciliation. He was no sooner informed by his nephew where his daughter and her husband were, than he declared he would instantly go to her. And when he arrived there he scarce suffered her to fall upon her knees before he took her up and embraced her with a tenderness which affected all who saw him and in less than a quarter of an hour was as well reconciled to both her and her husband as if he had himself joined their hands. In this situation were affairs when Mr. Allworthy and his company arrived to complete the happiness of Mrs. Miller, who no sooner saw Sophia than she guessed everything that had happened, and so great was her friendship to Jones that it added not a few transports to those she felt on the happiness of her own daughter. There have not, I believe, been many instances of a number of people met together where every one was so perfectly happy as in this company, amongst whom the father of young Nightingale enjoyed the least perfect content, for, notwithstanding his affection for his son, notwithstanding the authority and the arguments of Allworthy, together with the other motive mentioned before, he could not so entirely be satisfied with his son's choice, and perhaps the presence of Sophia herself tended a little to aggravate and heighten his concern as a thought now and then suggested itself that his son might have had that lady, or some other such. Not that any of the charms which adorned either the person or mind of Sophia created the uneasiness. It was the contents of her father's coffers which set his heart a-longing. These were the charms which he could not bear to think his son had sacrificed to the daughter of Mrs. Miller. The brides were both very pretty women, but so totally were they eclipsed by the beauty of Sophia, that had they not been two of the best-tempered girls in the world, it would have raised some envy in their breasts, for neither of their husbands could long keep his eyes from Sophia who sat at the table like a queen receiving homage, or rather like a superior being receiving adoration from all around her. But it was an adoration which they gave, not which she exacted, for she was as much distinguished by her modesty and affability as by all her other perfections. The evening was spent in much true mirth. All were happy, but those the most, who had been the most unhappy before. Their former sufferings and fears gave such a relish to their felicity as even love and fortune, in their fullest flow, could not have given without the advantage of such a comparison. Yet, as great joy, especially after a sudden change and revolution of circumstances, is apt to be silent, and dwells rather in the heart than on the tongue, Jones and Sophia appeared the least merry of the company, which Western observed with great impatience, often crying out to them, Why dost not talk, boy? Why dost look so grave? Hast lost thy tongue, girl? Drink another glass of wine, shut out another glass! 
and, the more to enliven her, he would sometimes sing a merry song, which bore some relation to matrimony and the loss of a maidenhead. Nay, he would have proceeded so far on that topic as to have driven her out of the room, if Mr. Allworthy had not checked him, sometimes by looks, and once or twice by a fie, Mr. Western. He began, indeed, once to debate the matter, and assert his right to talk to his own daughter as he thought fit, but as nobody seconded him, he was soon reduced to order. Notwithstanding this little restraint, he was so pleased with the cheerfulness and good humour of the company, that he insisted on their meeting the next day at his lodgings. They all did so, and the lovely Sophia, who was now in private become a bride too, officiated as the mistress of ceremonies, or, in the polite phrase, did the honours of the table. She had that morning given her hand to Jones in the chapel at Doctor's Common, where Mr. Allworthy, Mr. Western, and Mrs. Miller were the only persons present. Sophia had earnestly desired her father that no others of the company who were that day to dine with him should be acquainted with her marriage. The same secrecy was enjoined to Mrs. Miller, and Jones undertook for Allworthy. This somewhat reconciled the delicacy of Sophia to the public entertainment which, in compliance with father's will, she was obliged to go to greatly against her inclinations. In confidence of this secrecy, she went through the day pretty well, till the squire, who was now advanced into the second bottle, could contain his joy no longer, but filling out a bumper, drank a health to the bride. The health was immediately pledged by all present, to the great confusion of our poor blushing Sophia, and the great concern of Jones upon her account. To say truth, there was not a person present made wiser by this discovery, for Mrs. Miller had whispered it to her daughter, her daughter to her husband, her husband to his sister, and she to all the rest. Sophia now took the first opportunity of withdrawing with the ladies, and the squire sat into his caps, in which he was by degrees deserted by all the company, except the uncle of young Nightingale, who loved his bottle as well as Western himself. These two, therefore, sat stoutly to it during the whole evening, and long after that happy hour which had surrendered the charming Sophia to the eager arms of her enraptured Jones. Thus, reader, we have at length brought our history to a conclusion, in which, to our great pleasure, though contrary perhaps to thy expectation, Mr. Jones appears to be the happiest of all humankind. For what happiness this world affords equal to the possession of such a woman as Sophia, I sincerely own I have never yet discovered. As to the other persons who have made any considerable figure in this history, as some may desire to know a little more concerning them, we will proceed in as few words as possible to satisfy their curiosity. Allworthy hath never yet been prevailed upon to see Bliffel, but he hath yielded to the importunity of Jones, backed by Sophia, to settle two hundred pound a year upon him to which Jones hath privately added a third. Upon this income he lives in one of the northern counties, about two hundred miles distant from London, and lays up two hundred pound a year out of it, in order to purchase a seat in the next Parliament from a neighbouring borough, which he has bargained for with an attorney there. He is also lately turned Methodist, in hopes of marrying a very rich widow of that sect, whose estate lies in that part of the kingdom. Square died soon after he writ the before-mentioned letter, and as to Thwackham he continues at his vicarage. He hath made many fruitless attempts to regain the confidence of Allworthy, or to ingratiate himself with Jones, both of whom he flatters to their faces and abuses behind their backs. But in his stead Mr. Allworthy hath lately taken Mr. Abraham Adams into his house, of whom Sophia is grown immoderately fond, and declares he shall have the tuition of her children. 
Mrs. Fitzpatrick is separated from her husband and retains the little remains of her fortune. She lives in reputation at the polite end of the town, and is so good an economist that she spends three times the income of her fortune without running into debt. She maintains a perfect intimacy with the lady of the Irish peer, and in acts of friendship to her repays all obligations she owes her husband. Mrs. Western was soon reconciled to her niece Sophia, and hath spent two months together with her in the country. Lady Belliston made the latter a formal visit at her return to town, where she behaved to Jones as a perfect stranger, and with great civility wished him joy on his marriage. Mr. Nightingale hath purchased an estate for his son in the neighbourhood of Jones, where the young gentleman, his lady, Mrs. Miller, and her little daughter reside, and the most agreeable intercourse subsists between the two families. As to those of lower account, Mrs. Waters, returned into the country, had a pension of sixty pound a year settled upon her by Mr. Allworthy, and is married to Parson Supple on whom at the instance of sophia western hath bestowed a considerable living black george hearing the discovery that had been made ran away and was never since heard of and jones bestowed the money on his family but not in equal proportions for molly had much the greatest share as for Partridge, Jones hath settled fifty pound a year on him, and he hath again set up a school, in which he meets with much better encouragement than formerly. And there is now a treaty of marriage on foot between him and Miss Molly Seagram, which, through the mediation of Sophia, is likely to take effect. We now return to take leave of Mr. Jones and Sophia who, within two days after their marriage, attended Mr. Western and Mr. Allworthy into the country. Western hath resigned his family seat, and the greater part of his estate, to his son-in-law, and hath retired to a lesser house of his in another part of the country, which is better for hunting. Indeed, he is often as a visitant with Mr. Jones, who, as well as his daughter, hath an infinite delight in doing everything in their power to please him, and this desire of theirs is attended with such success that the old gentleman declares he was never happy in his life till now he hath there a parlour and an antechamber to himself where he gets drunk with whom he pleases and his daughter is still as ready as formerly to play to him whenever he desires it for jones hath assured her that as next to pleasing her one of his highest satisfactions is to contribute to the happiness of the old man so the great duty which she expresses and performs to her father renders her almost equally dear to him with the love which she bestows on himself. Sophia hath already produced him two fine children, a boy and a girl, of whom the old gentleman is so fond that he spends much of his time in the nursery, where he declares the tattling of his little granddaughter, who is above a year and a half old, is sweeter music than the finest cry of dogs in England. Allworthy was likewise greatly liberal to Jones on the marriage, and hath omitted no instance of showing his affection to him and his lady, who love him as a father. Whatever in the nature of Jones had a tendency to vice, has been corrected by continual conversation with this good man, and by his union with the lovely and virtuous Sophia. He hath also, by reflection on his past follies, acquired a discretion and prudence very uncommon in one of his lively parts. To conclude, as there are not to be found a worthier man and woman than this fond couple, so neither can any be imagined more happy. They preserve the purest and tenderest affection for each other, an affection daily increased and confirmed by mutual endearments and mutual esteem. Nor is their conduct towards their relations and friends less amiable than towards one another. And such is their condescension, their indulgence, and their beneficence to those below them, that there is not a neighbour, 
a tenant or a servant who doth not most gratefully bless the day when Mr. Jones was married to his Sophia. End of chapter 13 End of The History of Tom Jones, a Foundling, by Henry Fielding Recorded by Maureen Blasky of babasbeach.ca In Victoria, November 12, 2008